not be my death. Come to me and smile. Beatrice! Didn't you ever hear the story when you were young, Batlucker? Beatrice exists! Oh. Who do you suppose this Beatrice is? You're all dead! I stand to gain the most, is that it? Is there a witch or not? Is the killer one of us or not? Beatrice-sama is already here. There's no reason to be afraid anymore. One of you put that letter there. One of you is Beatrice! There are no witches! Then won't you alleviate my thousand years of boredom? Show me the power of humans! You've got it! Bring it on! You're my pawn. Fight well, my servant. You won't let me be bored, will you? <laughs> Hello, everybody. Sorry, I had to get the uh, mic on. Can I get the screen to work, please? Hello? For the love of God, hello? <laughs> There's a little trouble getting started sometimes for some reason. Come on, come on, come on. It'll show up, just give it a second. Hello? Hold on. Let me go in here. Huh. I'm, I'm sorry if it takes a second. This is so strange. Why is it not coming on? Hide, unhide? Yeah, try to minimize the window. Okay. Hmm. God, how how typical of uh, Beatrice to sabotage the stream. How terrible, how tragic. Yeah, I'm not, not entirely sure. It was doing this yesterday when I was like setting up for it, uh, but it would pop up after a second. So I'm not really uh, sure what's going on there. The telephones are down, so much hate, so true. Okay, hold on, I'm gonna... I'm gonna like, delete the game capture and then add it back. So give me just a moment. Nico. Great. Where is game capture? Is it even there? That's so strange. Hmm. Okay, you know what? I'm gonna try something a little different. Add source. Da, 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 da. Where is it? Window capture. Try that. There we go. Okay, hold up. Let me just resize this real quick. Okay, <clears throat> finally, we got it. 
Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you, Cat Dilu, for the two Canadian dollars. I'm Briochi Tree Che. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay. So. Uh, oh, I got a Glazer with the five memberships. Thank you so much for the gifted memberships. Yay. Um, gosh. <laughs> let, me, let me get on track. I was so thrown off by the fact that uh, things were... We're taking a moment. Oh yeah, do you like my, my custom notice, by the way? <laughs> um, anywho, before we head into the main episode proper, we are going to be looking at uh, some of the tip stuff that we didn't look at last time, just because uh, some people wanted to see that real quick, get that information. Um, and then after that, we will head into episode two. So we already, you've, ar you've all already seen the epitaph, uh, you've already seen the letters, uh, you already saw the score sheet, which was in the credits of episode one. So these are the two that we need to look at in particular. So this is Sawed Off Rifle Kinzo spec. Uh, this is obviously referring to the rifle that Natsuhi had uh, that she had gotten from Kinzo's study, I believe. Or somewhere uh, in Ken Kinzo's belongings. <clears throat> um, wow, that, that donation message took a, a while to come through. And yes, the ahaha.wav is playing with those notifications. Um, anywho. Uh, a sawed-off cut barrel custom version of a certain rifle which was popul a popular bestseller during the Wild West. The modification dramatically increased the portability and old-school charm in exchange for a devastating and drop in range. In addition, consecutive shots can be fired as quickly as a pistol if one works the lever action skillfully enough. Furthermore, the one-handed reload made possible by its characteristic lever handle should be irresistible for any true lover of old westerns. Welcome as a channel member, Yizu. To match with the Kinzo's personal pre match with Kinzo's personal preferences, it was made to handle 45 long colt bullets. The gun holds four plus one shots. Can I make the ahaha louder? Uh, yes, I can. One moment. Make it about that loud. Okay, let's try that. Um, and then, real quick. The Seven Stakes of Purgatory. So obviously this is referring to uh, the stakes that they found in the bodies. Stakes containing the seven magics that represents the seven deadly sins. They bury into the desired location on the target with unparalleled accuracy, following their user's orders. Since they flit about at ultra-high speeds and change their trajectories freely by bouncing off walls and the like, they have no blind spots and will hit their targets without fail no matter what. What form of cover they might be hiding behind. Additionally, their power can be turned to the part of the body they will strike. Extremely powerful as weapons, but they cannot target pure people who have not, not committed one of the sem seven deadly sins, or those who have a strong resistance to magical power. All right, so now that we've got that out of the way, we can head into the main episode proper, and I'm going to go ahead and give you all a warning for those of you who have uh, not played uh, Umineko before, obviously. Um... The beginning of this episode features a lot of George, particularly a lot of George and Shannon. So if you are, if you, if you have difficulty with that, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, it's also important. I'm sorry about that too. Uh, but you know, <clears throat> anywho. <laughs> yeah, content warning George. Um, anywho, let's get into it. Episode 2, Turn of the Golden Witch. Good morning. The Golden Witch has been waiting impatiently for you. Please, take your seat opposite her at the table. Have you rested well and deliberated over how you will play? The Witch has high expectations of you, and is determined to come at you right from the opening. I, too, am looking forward to observing your moves. The difficulty level is first rate. The Witch plans to make you surrender in an instant. Guys, are, are you ready? Do you think you can do it? Well, like it or not, here we go. Oh, 
adjust my chair. Oh yeah, by the way, I was, uh, if you're wondering what this screen is, I was testing the stream earlier, so I was uh, going through some of it. And uh, this is basically the screen that comes up when you've played a bit already. And it's like, hey, do you want to like skip to another chapter? Because you've already, you've already read some of it. But we're not going to cast the spell because we're going to start from the beginning. This story is real. It happened to my buddy, George. Actually, George is not my buddy. Look, George-sama. They're so cute. Look, look. Shannon found a pair of hammerhead sharks playfully swimming in the tank and made a fuss like a grade schooler seeing an aquarium for the first time. Yeah, they're really cute. I almost want to eat them. George, is this the appropriate thing to say? <laughs> I, I'd feel sorry for them. Did you know? I hear that only the peop the only people in the world who come to an aquarium and say that the fish look delicious are the Japanese. Is that so? I'm sure even Americans and Italians would want to eat these. Um, um, er. <laughs> also, Shannon, girl, I, like I, I don't I don't mean to insult her. I I love Shannon. She's she's great. What is this outfit? What is this like bowler hat? Like the it, it's just the trim it's 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 strange it's odd <clears throat> those clothes look good on you really i i i, I don't know about that george <laughs> uh, in the original version of the vn george is wearing a black shirt with tomitake flash writing on it i i oh god i completely forgot about that that explains the dog tags, though. Shannon embraced her chest with both hands in embarrassment. She apparently felt like she was being made fun of for wearing these clothes that she wasn't used to. Even though George's face didn't show it, the truth was that even he was surprised at how easily those tremendous words had left his lips. And, and he was as embarrassed as Shannon on the inside. However, when he saw how embarrassed Shannon was, he started to feel as though he was teasing the girl he liked, and instead of embarrassment, ticklish amusement welled up in him. Wait, that, that isn't just a feeling. I really am teasing the girl I like. It pains me to admit it, but I used to think that such embarrassing expressions had fallen so far out of use that they no longer showed up even in manga. Uh, Matthew Oakley, I didn't hate the George romance when I first read this. I don't think I even considered the age gap or the power dynamic. Yeah, when I first read this as a teenager, I wasn't like really conscious of it. So I was just like, oh yeah, that they have like a kind of dorky het relationship. Um, now, it, it takes on a, a bit of more sinister light when you look at it through that lens. On the contrary, if I'd seen a couple acting like that, I'd have felt like throwing rocks at them. <laughs> Very normal response, George. However, even if rocks were thrown at us now, I'm sure they would be just like confetti celebrating us. Now, I can't even remember those lonely days, when I felt jealous of couples who were completely oblivious to their surroundings. To use an old-fashioned phrase, these would be truly rose-colored days. I was so entranced that I no longer even noticed the big tank of the world's largest aquarium. Instead, I saw only Shannon happily playing with the fish, all her changing emotions showing on her face. It's amazing, isn't it? It's my first time seeing a tank large enough for a whale to swim in. I heard that this tank is the biggest selling point here, and that it's the biggest in the whole world. Is that so? That's amazing. It's really wonderful. It doesn't even look like a tank at all, but rather like they sliced off a part of the sea with a knife and brought it here. It's a very interesting way of uh, describing an aquarium. It does, doesn't it? This is a splendid little sea. Despite its size, oh uh, wait, I guess since this is George narration, I guess I should read it in George's voice. Um, and also, by the way, George's inner narration is so like, like, you know, to, to get on level for a moment here, like, obviously, uh, the chat hates George, and I understand that. <laughs> but, like, um, and I do too, but, but uh, hearing his, like, inner monologue is very enlightening to the kind of person he is, I think. It, it definitely sheds some light on, like, exactly how he views things, and especially the ways in which he, like, views things very strangely. Um, interesting characterization. 
Despite its size, I hadn't thought of the tank as anything more than a tank. That's why I thought her expression about slicing off a part of the sea with a knife was so interesting. No matter how far humans broaden their experiences, in the end, they can only hold a single personal worldview. I, I don't know about that. Maybe that's why it's so interesting to interact with someone who has a different worldview. I said that to her honestly. And she responded. Certainly, this might not be the real sea. But if those little guys, <laughs> if those little guys <laughs> swimming in there can believe that it's a sea, then it certainly is a sea. Even though they're inside a finite tank. The sea is finite too. No, even if it were infinite, how much could we cover in our whole lives? I'm sure that it would be so much smaller than a sea. Certainly. It's ironic, isn't it? Even though the world is so vast, most of us live, about, live out our lives without ever leaving our own country. All it takes is the belief that, it's a, that it is a complete world. For even the bottom of a narrow well to be a proper world, and a sea, in the eyes of the frogs who live there. Shannon, who spent her days as a servant on a small island ten kilometers in circumference, called Rokenjima, said that with a smile. Oh, thank you, Lambda. Oh yeah, we're get we're getting the uh, the little Hollywood movie intro again. Uh, so. To, uh, to reiterate um, a point that I've made in previous streams, obviously for people who are like Umineko fans who are joining into this that haven't seen my first episode streams, for the record, um, I, the person streaming this, have already read Umineko multiple times. <laughs> I, I know everything that's going to happen, but I have a lot of people in my, my audience who have not read it, and I'm really um, enthusiastic about it, really into it, so I wanted to share it with those people who may not necessarily uh, be able to like spend a lot of time reading or may have difficulties reading uh, for themselves. And uh, so I'm, I'm reading it to my audience to help with that. Um, so that's, that's the reason I'm doing these streams. Thus the title, story time, <clears throat> that kind of stuff. Uh, so I, I just, I wanna reiterate that because there was a little bit of confusion I saw in some comments uh, from people who joined in a little late on the previous parts that were like, you know, oh, like, why aren't you reacting very much to all of this? And it's because, not because I don't care, but because I, I already know everything that's going to happen. All right, time for the the world's most awkward lunch you've ever seen in your life. After we finished walking through the whole aquarium, we had a slightly late afternoon lunch at a restaurant with a nice view. Any boy's heart will jump at the sight of a buffet. <laughs> Did you see someone made an entire thread defending Tengen's writing while ignoring how he put Ryota in the killing game? Uh, I, I don't really engage with the Danganronpa fandom, to be completely honest. If people like that stuff, then it, it doesn't really bother me or anything. Um, I think people should, you know, be allowed to like what they like, uh, even if I don't, but, you know. <laughs> I, I may not understand it, but, you know, they can do as they wish. I myself was like that in the past, but with Shannon beside me, this buffet felt different. I couldn't shamefully make a huge pile of nothing but my favorite foods. I was, how should I put it? worried about my appearance, and chose a menu suited for snob, toast, salad, and coffee. If I were by myself, I'd have made a pile of greasy stuff like yakisoba, mashed potatoes, gratins, and the like. Shannon, is that enough for you? If it is, then I guess we men are animals with really bad fuel efficiency. It- he has, like, it's so... He, George's, like, little, like, quips about masculinity are so... so strange and so interesting. Uh, the 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 gender roles of it all the this part is uh has a lot of stuff like that it's it's very interesting um i didn't mean to imply that on shannon's tray there were there was only tea and salad maybe the very idea that she could get away with at least one more dish indicated i was thinking with my male stomach <laughs> yeah <laughs> what about your george sama will that be enough 
I think it's better for men to eat a little bit more. You normally eat more than that for lunch, don't you? Oops, right. You already know how much I eat from when I have lunch on the island. Yes. So I was wondering whether your stomach isn't feeling well today. Shannon was showing, cons was showing concern that I wasn't feeling well. Apparently I had made her worry with my stupid attempt to impress her. And in any case, it didn't seem like my stomach was going to let me keep this pretense up any longer. <laughs> I'll confess already. I was just trying to look cool. I just held back because I was with a girl. I thought so. Considering how much you eat during lunch at the family conferences, I thought this wasn't nearly enough. Please don't be so reserved, and feel free to go and choose another dish. This isn't fair. All the embarrassment's on me. What about you then, Shannon? Do you always manage your work for the Ushiramiya family while eating so little? Um, uh... Ow. <laughs> Shannon grew silent and blushed bright red. Apparently, I wasn't the only one putting on a front. When I realized that, my embarrassment disappeared completely. That's, that isn't enough for you e either, is it? Yes, normally you eat more than this for lunch. A woman's stomach is made of magic, so this is enough. Ow. This must mean that we're both trying to impress each other. Let's not hold back anymore, shall we? I smiled to show that I wouldn't make fun of her anymore and stood up from the seat. We've come all the way to Okinawa. It'd be a waste if we didn't eat some bitter melon. I'll go get some fried bitter melon or something. Come with me, Shannon. Come on, come on. Uh, yes. To anyone watching us, we might have seemed like a pretty humorous and, above all, embarrassing couple. Yeah, embarrassing is right, George. But it's only after becoming a couple that you realize this banter means the world to us and is our world. So no matter how cold the looks we might have gotten been getting from other people, we wouldn't even notice. Indeed, at this age, I finally understand the feelings of couples who want to endlessly flirt without any regard to their surroundings. After I returned with a plate piled up with fried food, Shannon arrived with a lovely cake. While laughing at our fake stoicism, we resumed our lunch. It's a shame that it's so cloudy, considering this restaurant has such a view of the sea. Our window seats, which we were lucky to get, showed us seaside scenery so grandiose that it didn't even fit entirely within our field of vision. However, because of the cloudy sky, it was a far cry from its normal beauty. Yes, it is. If it had been clear, we would have been... Bit, bleh, we would have seen quite the deep blue sea. Yes. I imagine you're used to seeing the sea on Rokenjima, but the sea here would surely have been an exceptional blue. It's a real shame. Uh, but no matter how blue it is, the sea I see during work might as well be grey. But today, I'm not working, so... I mean... Apparently, Shannon was doing her best to say an embarrassing line. But I grade... But I grade harshly. What do you mean? So close. If only you'd say, when I look at it with you, even the grayest sea looks deep blue. I'd have given you full marks and a reward. Uh, uh, I I'm sorry. What is this, like, what, what is this, like, playful chiding? Like, oh yeah, if I were your teacher, I would give you a bad grade for that one. <laughs> like, you don't need to make it any weirder than it already is. Mm. Want to hear what what the reward would have been? Um, if you wouldn't mind. No, I won't tell you. Ah ha ha ha! That's not fair. When I was in elementary school, I was always the kid that got bullied. Whenever when everyone teased me, I grew nervous and speechless to the delight of the bullies. Back then, I wondered why everyone teased me, but now teasing Shannon like this, I understand why. What a normal thing to say about your your girlfriend with the weird age gap. Shut up, dude. This is so much fun. I can play with her emotions however I please, and I can have them all to myself. Normal things for a person to say. Right now, I can't think of any higher pleasure, which is exactly why I have to treat her lightly. I don't want her to get embarrassed and have a bad time, so I decided to end the topic there and then. It's not good to be too persistent. Yeah, no, it's not, no. When you finished your lunch, do you want to take a walk on the beach? Perhaps the clouds will clear up and we'll be able to see a picturesque sea. That's a nice idea. I'd like to do that. Okay, that's what we'll do. But that looks like a really delicious cake. I wonder if I should get one like that too. You mustn't. 
If you eat cake after eat already eating so much, you'll get fat. Hideyoshi-sama's blood runs pretty thick in you, George-sama, so if you don't take care, you'll get chubby. So, Shannon, would, would you stop liking me if I got fat? I wouldn't stop liking you if you did. Y you don't need to- you don't- you don't need to clarify these things to Shannon, dude. I didn't mean it that way. I mean, if you didn't- if you don't take good care of your body, your health will... Ow. Mother warns me all the time, too. Maybe I also need to take up Chai Chi Chuan or something to get exercise. If you want to lose weight, it's best to start by reconsidering your eating habits, instead of doing intense exercise. The exercise has to come on top of that or you won't get any results, I hear. In other words, you're telling me not to eat cake, right? Then I guess I'll just have to gaze at you while you stuff your cheeks with that cake, Shannon. <laughs> I'll psychically enjoy the cake. By linking to your senses. Uh, er, maybe one whole cake is too much. But maybe just half of one would be alright. Here, it's really delicious. Shannon cut her own cake and tried to move half to my salad plate. I had no doubt that she wanted to share the flavor of the delicious cake with me. Even so, I deliberately and meanly pulled my plate away from her. She blinked her eyes in surprise. She couldn't seem to figure out if that was a refusal of the cake or not. So I winked, opened my mouth, and said, Uh, I... God, I hate this dude. <laughs> <laughs> this is what you wanted from the beginning, isn't it? Gosh, you're such a pampered child, George Sema. Okay, say ya. This fucking zoom in. While still, still wearing an embarrassed, ex exasperated face, Shannon offered the cake to me with a fork. Chomp. It tasted like a cheap chocolate cake you could find anywhere. Still, it was exceptional. Because eating cake in such an embarrassing way, as if we were the ultimate stereotypical lovey-dovey couple, has been my dream for many years. It made this cake's flavor heavenly. If the earth is destined to end someday, I wouldn't have any regrets if it happened right then. Yeah, I- I- to be fair, I don't think the zoom was supposed to be for that. I think it was just, like, she's doing the like, oh, here comes the plane, I'm- I'm getting closer in. But it is awkward because of where the- the eye line is. It was such a moment of bliss. After that, we gathered shells, ran from the waves, and enjoyed each other's company while walking along the beach. In the end, the clouds never parted. However, we both believed that our eyes were still reflecting a deep blue sea. Somehow, I'm so happy. It makes me scared. You do say that from time to time. What is it that you're afraid of? Gee, I, uh, I wonder what Shannon could possibly be afraid of. I'm... A servant of the Ishiramiya family. For someone like me to be here together with a member of the Ishiramiya family. Um, it just seems like too much for me. I'm also surprised. I didn't just meet you today or yesterday, Shannon-chan. We've known each other for years now. But we would only ever exchange greetings during family meetups, barely a few times per year. I never imagined we'd become close enough that I could spend time with you like this. It's the same for you too, right? Um, I, um, hmm? I did imagine. No, um, uh, rather than imagination, it was more like I was fantasizing. You're always so considerate and gentlemanly, so I wondered if we were in a relationship. Um, I just had fantasies of what it would be like. Uh, how old were they when they started dating? Um, I'm not entirely i can't remember like george and shannon have been dating for like before the family conference i think maybe like a year or two something like that maybe or maybe actually yeah the start of the relationship is kind of vague it was not when shannon was 12. Uh, they met like when she was really young uh, but yeah like one or two years so like yeah. It's it's still bad either way, though. <laughs> then our relationship happened thanks to you, your believing heart. Oh, whoops. We... Yeah. 
the Cthulhu with the two Canadian dollars. Noah, get the boat. <laughs> Very true. Magic dwells in the power of dreaming, so I'm sure that it was magic that brought us together. And yeah, uh, Shannon has been working at the mansion since she was six. That's true, because she is 16 right now and she's been working at the mansion for 10 years. Uh, if you think that's weird, yeah, it is. I wonder why she's been working at the mansion since she was six. I really think that it truly was magic. But you know, that's not quite right. Every time we met, I saw you as more and more beautiful, and you grew to occupy a large space in my heart. Wait, how old is George? George is, uh... He's either 23 or about to turn 23, right? Hold up. Oh, okay, it doesn't actually say on his profile right now. But yeah, he's like either like 22 going on 23, or 23. Then the fact that we're here today is simply an inevitable consequence, rather than something caused by magic or a miracle. No, a miracle did happen. George Sama. She stopped at the water's edge and gazed beyond the sea. A miracle? No, magic. Hold on, I'm, a I'm gonna shut the cat out of the hallway because he is uh, clawing at the door. Okay, according to the wiki, he's 23. Then yeah, he's 23. He's not allowed in the office right now because he peed on Austin's chair. <laughs> so I can't trust him while I'm in here by myself. Unless we're both taking up seats, he's not allowed in. <clears throat> no, magic. It happened. I was bewildered by that slightly mysterious expression, which I sometimes heard her use. Magic, you say? Yes, magic. You probably won't believe me even if I say it, so I won't. But that magic definitely had the power to grant the miracle which brought you and me together. Hmm, I wonder what Shannon is talking about here. You mean like a lucky chant to make your wish come true? Perhaps. Maybe it was something like that. Except that it wasn't pretend. It really was real magic. Hmm. Perhaps Shannon isn't alone in wanting to credit an encounter on a miracle, or on a chance. It might be a universal thing so all girls share. What do you mean? For a man like me, an encounter with a girl is 70% effort to try and please her and 20% raw courage. Okay, George. And only 10% chance. What she believes to be everything, ca everything carries little relative weight within me. Maybe that way of thinking is, in itself, calculating and typical of men. Yeah, you know, I'm a, I'm a big smart boy. I, I have a Reddit brain. <laughs> but were I to express that in words, any kind of magic would be broken. I do think that to become this close has taken many fortuities, concessions, and great efforts from us both. We have this private time together now as a result of all those things we put together. And if she wants to call that magic, that isn't strange in the slightest. Uh, Nikki M., um, uh... The Fuguin house is kind of fucked, but that's not exactly how they described it. The way they described it was more that, like, this is a orphanage that is bankrolled by Kinzo, and a lot of the orphans end up working as servants and end up making so much money within a few years that they don't have to do anything after that. They can just leave and start their life. And, uh... Actually, wait, that's a... Hmm. I was about to say a piece of information, but that's a spoiler, so I'm not gonna say that. <clears throat> That's why I answered her the way they did, way I did. Yes. If the same fate were repeated a hundred times, you and I might have gotten into a relationship like this only once. Our distant and formal connection could have continued right up to now, even as we both remained conscious of each other. From the perspective of those otherworldly selves, we're undoubtedly in a miraculous relationship. It's not like that. It really is magic. Perhaps this is something that men will never believe. No matter how often you tell them. Kanon-kun didn't believe me at all either. I believe you. Because I wouldn't want to break the magic by not believing in it. George-sama. In a small voice, I apologized for making light of her magic. 
Those words seem to make Shannon a lot happier. After all, if a pair of people believes in the magic of love, it becomes eternal. Oh, that's right. I have a request, if you'd be willing to indulge me. Yes? What is it? You know how you call me George Summer? It's not that I dislike it, but would you not call me that anymore? Of course, you have to keep up your appearance with the Yoshiramiya family, so I won't force you to do this during your everyday routine at Rokenjima. But when we're alone, I'd rather you didn't call me that. Yeah, let's create that rule. A, a rule? What would happen if I broke it? Good point. Maybe rule violations do need to have some kind of penalty attached. What should it be? Want to hear? No, I don't want to hear. <laughs> no, me either! <laughs> I'll have to think about what it should be. Yes. George, son. Yeah. That sounds wonderful, doesn't it? I'm so happy, Shannon. I... Oh, wait, that's from Shannon. I... I have the name Sayo as well. Right. Rules must be fair. I'll abide by that too. And from now on, I'll call you Sayo. All right? Sayo? Yes. I put my arm around her shoulder and held her close. Her... <laughs> what? What? Her delicate body was pulled irresistibly towards me and she leapt into my chest like a doll. See, this is why I'm like, even though I do think that Ryukishi kind of like, unfortunately glanced over the age implications when he was writing this relationship, with statements like this, I don't think he was like, unaware of how this in particular would come across. Especially with like the whole servant, uh, like, family dynamic and everything. Like, I think he was aware of this, and I do think he was intentionally interrogating that to some extent. As I held her head in my arms, we looked at the horizon together. What a deep blue sea. I'm so happy that we were able to see it together. Me too. It makes me very happy that I could look at such a deep blue sea with you. As we gazed at the gray sea, and a, light rain began, and a light rain began to sprinkle down, we kept listening to each other's heartbeats. It's definitely the way George is imagining her reaction and probably not the truth. Yeah, that is going to become very important later on. Definitely pay attention to that. Pay attention to the ways in which George assumes a role or an attitude of Shannon in absence of an answer. The sound of wave. Oh, okay, right. This is not George. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm just uh, just reading the chat for a second. Anywho, <clears throat> the sound of waves soaked into my ears. Is this whole chapter from George's POV? No, thank God, no. <laughs> no. This was the sound of raging waves. My body, bathed in painfully cold splashes, did not allow me to forget. The memory of the day when my old fate was broken and smashed. In the past, tomorrow had been literally like a mirror to me. All I could see in it was the same me that existed today. My tomorrow would never be any different from my today. That was my old fate. But at that moment, for the first time, I saw a different fate beyond the mirror. The witch whispered. She tempted me to take a bite out of the fruit of knowledge. She tormented me, saying that as long as I stayed in the paradise of God, I would remain furniture. And so I learned of love and decided to choose to become a person. Those days were like sweetly melting honey. But then I hadn't realized that they were be the beginning of days filled with a new kind of suffering. Taking a motorboat that I had just been told about, I made my way to this... I forget how you pronounce this word. Is it islet? Islet? Whichever. No, I couldn't possibly call it a... that word that I can't pronounce. Somebody, somebody in the chat, save me, save me. <laughs> islet, okay. I thought so because it's like islet, island, but yeah, yeah. <clears throat> It'd really be more appropriate to call it a reef. It had a tori and a small shrine for the, lo for the local deity. It was probably built to worship the guardian deity of Rokenjima. Even though I didn't know the exact meaning, I understood that it had a holy significance. 
Uh, for those of you who don't remember, because it's been a while, uh, but back in the first episode, whenever the family is coming up on the boat, uh, they mention this uh, tori. They mention the little reef shrine and the fact that it is gone uh, mysteriously. And Kumasawa says that it was struck by lightning. <clears throat> Despite being in a place like this, I took just one more look around to see if there was anyone observing me. The only things I could see were the stormy ocean, Nijima looming in the distance, and the waves breaking up against Brokenjima's steep cliffside. I readied myself, timidly approached the small shrine, and took up the mirror that had been placed there. It was an old-looking mirror, dim and dirty. If it were an ordinary mirror, that would probably give you a terribly bad impression of its value. However, since the mirror had been offered to this small shrine, that quality made me feel some kind of divinity from it. And I realized, this was not merely a mirror. Even if it was nothing more than an old-looking mirror to a non-believer like myself, in actuality, it was a mirror that had an important meaning. Is it really all right to break it after being captivated by honeyed words? No, this is no mirror. It is the inescapable life I have lived up until today. My fate. Break it. Break it. And seize a life from beyond the mirror. If I don't break it, my life will forever be a pair of facing mirrors. Nothing will ever change in the slightest. The witch whispers. She tempts me to take a bite out of the fruit of knowledge. Or maybe I already have, a, have had a taste of that fruit. Because I ended up knowing those maddening emotions. Just as Adam and Eve felt compelled to pluck the fig leaf, I can no longer go without breaking this mirror. I fought with conflict for many days. Inside my heart, the virtuous part of me and the part that sided with the witch repeatedly fought each other. And now, here I am. Did the part of me who is here win or lose? There's only one thing I know. To obtain something, you must be ready to lose something. The cowards who don't risk loss and never try to change anything will never be given the path, the key to open the path to a new future. The key is already in my hands. It is to break this, to break it. Is there any other effort I can make as furniture imprisoned on Rokenshma? No, there's nothing but this. Come, have courage. I'll free myself from being mere furniture and I'll accept my new sufferings and become human. These are surely the small and large trials I must impose on myself. Now, break it. Break the eternally unchangeable fate that imprisons me. Into pieces! I raised it high, thought back on all those days of conflict. And after a time far too brief to do them justice, I finished my reflections and threw it. thunder roared, crying out against me for my outrageous act. It was truly the wrath of the angels, preparing to banish me from eternal paradise. I looked down on the mirror tumbling at my feet, broken in two equal parts. And having made sure I accomplished my task, I looked up at the enraged sky and screamed. I... I kept... the promise. Now... it's your turn to keep your promise with me, right? The thunder roared once more. I had already been banished from paradise, so I would have to struggle by myself in order to live. The witch had said it. That's the single element of the world. To lose it means to lose the world. Like how a flask with a hole in the bottom can't be filled, no matter how much water you scoop into it. I kept the promise. Now, it's your turn to keep your promise. Please, grant my wish. Beatrice Sama!
to come off mute for a second. Tofu Dispenser, Shannon knows Beatrice this time? Maybe a better question would be to ask, did Shannon know Beatrice last time? My mind wandered. Back to the days when I could barely imagine the happiness I have today. I was a middle schooler at the time. An ordinary girl who dreamed about love, as is normal at that age. But I really should not have dreamed this dream. Because I am furniture. Furniture is nothing more than a tool, and is not human. For a person less than human such as myself, just receiving my education was more than sufficient happiness. So even thinking about love was more than I deserved. The Ashiramiya Family Conference was a customary event held every October, but relatives would occasionally visit at other times as well. Of course, they didn't come to just to drink, just to drink tea. Oh, okay, this isn't a uh, Shannon narration, this is just general narration. <clears throat> on this day, Ava's family had visited the head on Rokenjma. The three people from Krause's family and the three people from Ava's family had gathered in the parlor, and were having a friendly chat as they updated everyone on their situations. Genji had supposedly told Kinzo of Ava's family's arrival, but he hadn't come down yet. He was probably immersed in his own research and couldn't spare the time. This often happened, so the others waited patiently for their fickle father to come down. Oh, that does sound promising. Study a lot at your father's, and do your best to become able to help him soon. Thank you very much. The mentor's father has introduced me to are providing me truly valuable study. Everything I learn is something that can't be learned in school. It's not language or math you learn in school, which is studies the attitude to have towards studying. Once you form that basis, you can finally start a long period of study that'll last your entire life. People who don't get this will spend the rest of their lives with rocks for brains, totally unable to absorb any knowledge. They might get full marks in math and language, but they'll be useless for their company. Hmm, that's exactly right. Hideyoshi-san, your education policy is always truly excellent. You're not a full man yet, George. Always keep that in mind and embrace your studies. Stop that, honey. George is always doing his very best, aren't you? Truly excellent. I wish our Jessica would learn from him. Yeah. Are you still holding a grudge about my test scores? I said I am studying for the exams. I'm doing it my own way. You don't have to bring it up here as well. Cram it already. When George was praised for his diligence, the conversation would nearly always turn to Jessica, who hated studying. Jessica made an openly displeased face, as though she'd known it would come back to her. My, my. In addition to studying, I think you need to learn to speak a little more ladylike, don't you? It's quite shameful for a daughter who bears the Ushiramiya family crest. Oh, but this is charming in itself, don't you think? Times change. The times when we had to feign purity in order for a man to allow us to eat ended a long time ago. Yes, yes. I knew you'd understand, Auntie Ava. <laughs> My heart headache is truly trying today. Are you all right? Aunt Natsuri, your face looks off color. Thank you. I'm all right. But time really has flown. It feels just like yesterday when you would run around half naked by the beach and come back soaked. <laughs> Wasn't Jessica-chan the same? And now she's a lady who fusses over how to put on makeup. You really are particular about your eyebrows. You look really cute today. Thank you very much. Nobody noticed, so my confidence was taken a beating. A full smile rose to Jessica's face as the results of her own studies were finally noticed. Ava smiled back just as widely. Then she turned that smile towards Natsuhi. Come on, Natsuhine-san. You must take notice of small changes in your own child. Poor Jessica-chan. She must have wanted her mother to notice first, surely. It's fine, it's fine. She never notices anything like that. Jessica. I do not think much of you calling your mother she. Apologize. <laughs> Jessica, do not use the wrong pronouns for your mother. <laughs> you know that she uses she, they. You should switch it up every once in a while. Later, I will speak to you at length about your language. <sighs> if you've had enough of the annoying little kid, just say so next time. I'm getting out of here. This room's getting stuffy. Jessica... Jessica was still at that unpredictable age with exams right around the corner. 
Recently, she had clashed often with her mother, who was enthusiastic about her education. Excuse me. Kia? Jessica, making to leave the parlor in a bad mood, and Shannon, pushing a serving cart loaded with tea, bumped into each other. Uh, Shannon, don't bother with my tea. I'm just going to wander around the garden. Uh, Milady. Shannon, the tea is getting cold. Serve it quickly. <laughs> well, Nesmi, she, you switch up Natsui's pronouns too. That's fair. That's fair. Glass houses. That's true. Always thought they as a group of people. They can be used singularly. Um, it's been it's been used singularly for a very long time for uh, certain contexts. <clears throat> but yeah. Uh, anyhow. My my apologies. Shannon hadn't actually done anything wrong, but Natsuhi, who felt like some shame to herself had been shown, lashed out at her emotionally. This was something that often happened in the Yoshirimiya family. But it seemed that Shannon wasn't strong-willed enough to accept it that way. She shrunk back and nervously prepared the black tea. She had the unfortunate habit of making more mistakes when she felt intimidated. Her pitiful appearance dispersed the peaceful atmosphere that had been there until just a moment ago. That wasn't really Shannon's fault, but she thought she might be the source and felt a pressure on her chest. Her shaking fingers made the porcelain clatter, and you couldn't have called it graceful, not even as an empty compliment. The more pitiful everyone thought that was, the greater the silence grew. The more irritated Natsuhi looked, and the more Shannon cowered. Shannon's thin neck felt like it was being choked and suffocated by the death god called Tension. Yo, welcome Deviant Witch to the channel, members. Thank you so much. Then, George spoke cheerfully as if to blow away the stiff atmosphere. That's a nice smell. What kind of tea is it? Um... This is... No, don't say it. I'll guess. It's a very distinctive smell, so I probably know it. Is it Earl Grey? I think it probably is. <laughs> it probably is Earl Grey. When you get back to the kitchen, check the can. Ho? Oh? George Kern, are you knowledgeable about black tea? I'm currently in the service of a company president who knows a lot about black tea. After enough time listening to his expositions, I picked up a little bit of it. Oh yeah, the president of Okonogi Foods. That sort of in-depth knowledge is his specialty. The names of tea often refer to the place where it's made, right? So this is something cultivated from a place called Earl Grey? I've heard that long ago in England there was an Earl called Grey, and it was named after him. Incidentally, this distinctive smell doesn't come from tea leaves, but from a fruit called a bergamot, which is a relative of the mandarin orange. Is that so? I never knew that. Having that knowledge, the tea will taste even more delicious. Alcohol and cigarettes are the same. With luxuries, you gotta appreciate the romance. Knowledge like this deepens the taste. It's the same with the advertising on medicine. Natsi Nesan, you should try reading the explanation on your favorite headache medicine someday. <laughs> <laughs> A fine idea. Try it tonight. Yes, I shall. shannon John, open the pot and have a look. You should be able to find some dried bergamot mixed in with the tea leaves. Ah, uh, yes. It's there. Something like dried orange peels mixed in. Yep. That's probably bergamot, the main ingredient in Earl Grey's scent. The scent is vivid, so it gives the impression of having a sharp taste, but it's a docile taste that's easy to drink. It might be lovely to make it with milk. The scent should become more mild. If there's anything left in the pot after you've poured for everyone, you really should make a milk tea out of it and try it out. Ah, uh, yes. Thank you very much. George gave her a small wink. Shannon finally realized that George had been doing her a favor by calming down the atmosphere in the room. And he had been doing it for her sake as she had lost her self-confidence. <laughs> Hand George a reluctant W for taking the heat off of her. Yeah, George ever so often does something that's good, but uh, it's kind of balanced out by all of the not so good. <laughs> the Ushirimiya family did not pamper their servants. So if there, wasn't, if there was any awkwardness, they would be harshly punished. So it didn't often happen that they were giving a help in, helping hand like this. Thanks to George's concern, Shannon was somehow able to get a hold of herself and finish serving everything safely. 
If she was calm when she worked, she could easily carry out her tasks elegantly and flawlessly. By the time the black tea was laid out on the table and the elegant scent drifted around, the room was completely back to how it had been, in a peaceful mood as everyone praised George's knowledge. Shannon wanted to thank him for saving her, but it didn't look like she would get the chance. So she at least thanked him inside her heart, praying to God that George would hear it and push the serving cart away. George Nissan has always lent a helping hand in times like this, by changing the topic or something. Shannon and Jessica could be seen in the Rose Garden. Jessica, having gotten into a fight with her mother, now felt unable to simply nonchalantly wander back into the parlor, and so found herself here, killing time. When I think back on it, I feel that maybe it wasn't the first time he's helped me like that. Whenever I made a careless mistake and George Summer was there, he would always naturally smooth things over and make things more harmonious, I think. Maybe it wasn't something as direct as picking up a fork that had been dropped, but that was his way of caring. Even servants have pride. They want to fix their own mistakes by themselves. Because if a guest helped them out with that, they would lose face. He's really good at reading between the lines in those kinds of situations. Well, maybe that's George Nissan's aesthetic take on things. That guy's more of a show-off than he looks. <laughs> that's not true. I think he's a really wonderful person. Hmm? Shannon, you haven't fallen in love with George Nissan, have you? Shannon had refuted Jessica's words uncharacteristically forcefully, so Jessica caught on immediately. No, that's not it, I think. Come to think of it, I've never heard of any kind of, kind of gossip about George Nissan. Wait. Actually, didn't I hear him say that family-oriented girls were his type? Nice, that fits you perfectly, Shannon. It, it does? I, I don't... I'm not, um, qualified for that. You sure are qualified. You've known each other for years. You're almost childhood friends. They say that when you have a natural relationship where you don't think of each other as a boy and a girl, it's plain sailing once you do. No doubt. Jessica loved teen magazines with these kinds of stories, and she was always on the phone talking excitedly with her friends about that kind of thing. So she had a keen intuition for this kind of romantic topic. So this wasn't the first time a topic like this had been brought to Shannon. But it was certainly the first time she had noticed George as a member of the opposite sex. She was furniture, and George was an honored guest connected to the Ushir Mia family. <laughs> Don't be the wing girl to this, Jessica. Yeah, I, Jessica is also a, a teen. She's an older teen, so she also kind of doesn't get it. She had thought it impermissible to even imagine any deeper relationship, so she hadn't thought about it. Jessica was taking immense pleasure in poking fun at all this since it didn't affect her. Shannon was doing her best to make sure that her blushing cheeks weren't discovered. So if George showed up at a time like that, there would be no way that she would be able to keep her cool. They saw George come out from the entrance hall of the mansion. It looked like they, she had seen them as well. He headed over, waving his hand. Shannon had to frantically try to regain her ordinary composure before George reached them. Grandfather finally came down. Now they're having a d an adult discussion, so they chased me out. <laughs> Escaping then was the right choice. I'd sooner kiss a god of pestilence than go look Grandfather in the face. You shouldn't speak that way. However, I think Grandfather may think of us as such pestilent creatures. After all, we came over here specifically to ask him for money for business. That's right. This wasn't the customary annual October family conference. Ava's family had visited to apply for a business loan from the main family. Kinzo had vast resources and he lent those out to his children. Of course, this was not money to lend because they had gotten themselves into financial trouble. How would they expand their business, using the vast amount of money that they had borrowed? How much interest would be attached, and how soon could it be repaid? This wasn't a loan for the have-nots. It was a loan for those who were on the offense. Kinzo judged strictly whether it was worth lending out his fortune, and afterwards he strictly oversaw its use. So there was occasionally the spectacle where relatives visited Rokenjima and explained their business to Kinzo. To the parents, it may well have been a meeting concerning the moment of large sums of money, forcing immense stress of movement of large sums of money, forcing immense stress upon them. But to Jessica, who lived on this isolated island called Rokenjima, it was a precious opportunity to meet up with her cousins. So even her bad mood from getting into that fight with her mother was immediately cured by this chat with the infrequent visitor, George. My family's a total bunch of tightwads. 
They've probably got money to spare. Why not be generous with it? I bet my dad and grandfather are both just being really tight. It's natural to be prudent when lending money. Of course, my father has come up with a plan where he can expand his, biz expand his business, with, bleh, business with what he borrows and which he can definitely repay. Everything else will be up to the presentation. Really, I would have liked to watch alongside and learn. But Mother chased me out. I'm a little let down. It seems that the Master still scolds Krausama and Avasama in just the same way he did when they were kids. I'm sure she didn't want to show that to you, her son. As Shannon hung her head, she thought back on those scenes she had grown used to seeing while working in the mansion. Even Kraus, who acted haughtily towards his siblings, was still treated like a child by Kinzo. Shannon herself had often seen Kinzo slapping Kraus, or making him sit in Seiza style. Uh, let's see. Get to the glossary. Seiza is a traditional Japanese manner of sitting used for formal occasions where respect is demanded. To sit in Seiza style, you kneel on the floor or on a cushion with your legs folded under your thighs and sit on your heels, with the tops of your feet entirely flat on the floor and big toes overlapping. The position can be quite uncomfortable to maintain for long periods of time, especially to those unaccustomed to it. Uh, so did chapter two just begin like chapter one didn't happen? I'm a few minutes late and rather not rewind. Uh, Yes, sort of. Um, but right now we're actually doing some backstory stuff that takes place before the conference. <clears throat> it was probably deeply humiliating to have that forced upon him at his age. In the Ushiramiya family, taking care to not be present when this happened was one of the great tasks of the servants. Of course, that did mean that Shannon had been making mistakes by being witness to it. Probably. Realizing that and going away may be for my duty as their child. Well, all that aside, the flowers in this garden are truly splendid this year, aren't they? George stretched as he said that. And truly effortlessly, he changed the subject away from something that had become a little less, a little gloomy. This time, Shannon noticed it too. This person, George, was highly sensitive to the mood of a group, and was always caring enough to change the subject to something harmonious. It had been so smooth that Shannon hadn't noticed it until today. Today, Shannon had to really admire that behavior of George's. Almost all of the boys Shannon knew of her own age were her classmates during her education, but they were all immature, and none of them had the composure that George did. Gee, I, I wonder why they're less m mature than George... Oh, God. Even though he had j been just another guest until moments ago. Now, she couldn't describe him with just that. But that was idle thinking, irrelevant to her work as a servant. Shannon tried to chase it away with a small shake of her head. Hmm? What's up? Uh, no, it's nothing. Um, shall I prepare some tea? Uh, I'll prepare some more of that Earl Grey for you. <laughs> so, you remembered the name of that black tea. I'm happy. Um, um... Hmm? Um, thank you for your concern back then. Shannon was finally able to put her thanks into words. If you wrote them out on paper, they wouldn't seem like much. But Shannon had needed just a little courage to say them out loud. But George played dumb. What's this? I don't remember doing anything I should be thanked for. <laughs> it seemed he was being a gentleman in his own way, saying that he hadn't helped her because he wanted to be thanked. It seemed that George's response had been more or less predictable to Jessica. She burst out laughing uncontrollably. See? This is it! Isn't he a show-off? No, I don't think that's... Jessica made fun of Shannon as she remained silent, red-faced. George didn't know the details, but he naturally joined in, laughing the same way. The three of them lazily walked around the garden, ta taking, talking about what was new. George, as the oldest cousin, talked about his life experiences. Jessica talked about recent life on Rokenjima, and Shannon talked about her recent work. These silly little topics went round and round in circles. Even when the other stories had been fascinating, Shannon had never felt particularly connected to their contents. She was nothing more than a servant, and she had no intention of delving into her master's lives. She simply wanted them to enjoy their time speaking with her, and was only pretending to listen intently and nodding at the right moments. Shannon is dissociating in the garden, me too girl. But for some reason, she found talking with George deeply interesting today. Even for things she would normally ignore, she felt like she could feel a kindness hidden beneath those words. For some reason, she wanted to know more things about George, no matter how trivial. So she stared fixedly at him. 
she thought that as far as looks went, this person, Ushidomiya George, was probably about average, and he didn't really stick out. But he was diligent, serious, and deeply thoughtful in a way that allowed him to understand people's hearts and care for them. But she had never been aware of those things until now. She might not have met him many times, but she had known his face for many years. Even so, she had not noticed once until now. So Shannon felt ashamed of this, and her cheeks went red. So yeah, I, I assume, if I'm remembering correctly, that this stuff takes place, obviously, before the date scene we saw at the beginning of the episode. This is kind of like Shannon noticing for the first time that she might like him. Maybe George thought that Shannon was appreciating him talking about himself, because he continued to relate to his personal stories. But Jessica didn't miss that slight change in Shannon. So she turned the discussion around to the topic Shannon wanted to hear about the most. Oh yeah, come to think of it. George Nissan, did you finally get a girlfriend yet or what? Yeah, okay, yeah, this is definitely before. <clears throat> what is this? Out of the blue. Normally, just George's reaction would have been answer enough. But for some reason, as he was now, Shannon found herself unable to understand it unless he said it clearly. Um, um, George Sum is very nice, so I'm sure he must be very popular with the girls. No. <laughs> Quit it, Shannon. That's pretty mean, cornering him like that. <laughs> I, I wasn't trying to be mean. Thank you for your happy wrong impression. It's a shame, but I still don't have a relationship with any special girl. As you can see, my looks are below average, and I can't speak wittily in a way that can entertain a girl. I, I don't think that's true. I think that a man's charm is decided by things you can't measure on the outside. That's why, um, I think that you might be, um, a very charming man, George Sama. Shannon was uncharacteristically verbose. Compared to her normal self, she was being very wordy indeed. George looked fairly pleased about hearing his own charm described, but he was just a little surprised at this high praise. Jessica, sure now that her own imagination was right on, acted as though she could barely hold back her laughter. Thank you, Shannon John. I hope I soon run into a girl gracious enough to find me attractive. Yes, I'm sure you will. I'm sure there's a girl not... I mean, a lot of girls who will recognize your real charm. She probably wanted to say there's a girl not very far away. She avoided saying that much, drawing a final line as a servant. I mean, to be fair, she couldn't really be referring to many more people if she says that, because the only other girls around are related to George. <laughs> really? I guess I'm kind of embarrassed. Maybe he had never been praised this much by a girl. George's face turned just as bright red as Shannon's. As she watched the two of them, Jessica giggled sadistically. Well, I'm sure you'll eventually find a wonderful partner, George Nissan. But I don't think you'll be able to escort your partner as you are now, right? Your brain- your braininess may be a diligent work- Your brain- wait, okay. Yeah, okay. I did read that right the first time. It was just a strange way of phrasing it. Your braininess may be a diligent worker, but it looks like you're totally clueless when it comes to that aspect of your studies. Excuse me for being ignorant. I'll start studying that bit by bit. How would you do that by yourself? Are you going to watch movies about love? Learn from Uncle Hideyoshi? <laughs> <laughs> you're milking it for all it's worth, aren't you? Men aren't a match for girls in this kind of conversation. Normally, when George and Jessica got together, their parents would say, George is diligent and admirable, and Jessica is lazy and rude. So it was probably irresistible fun for Jessica when their roles were finally reversed. George also realized so this also realized that, so this time he was content with being the one who was teased. Then George Nissan, as long as you're okay with it, why not practice a bit with Shannon? Keep Shannon entertained all day long on a date. What do you think? Uh, what are you, milady? When she heard Jessica's audacious plan, Shannon's face turned bright red and a donut of smoke rose from it with a poof. That's a very attractive plan, but I'd feel bad for Shannon Chan. I wouldn't just be I wouldn't just be wasting her precious day off. I'd also be butting in on the ideal moment when she'd be able to be alone with someone she really has feelings for. I couldn't do something so boorish. I um I also um don't have a person I have feelings for or anything, so um caring for me like that is yes, it's unnecessary. Shannon's blood had all rushed to her head, and it looked like even she didn't know what she was babbling about. Jessica, who knew how Shannon normally was, seemed to find that really comical. She couldn't hide her cackling laugh anymore. Is that true? 
I can't believe a cute girl like you would be single, Shannon Chan. Uh, I... I'm a servant, so, um, I don't have any opportunities to meet boys, and, um... Which means that in the future, if Shannon's gonna have any chance of getting herself a wonderful guy, she needs practice with relationships, right? So you each want the same thing. All right, that'll work nice. <laughs> Jessica irresponsibly cheered the two of them on. Now George was also hanging his head red-faced. George, I've been calling for you. Couldn't you hear me? Oh boy, here we go. Since Ava appeared in what was already an embarrassing situation, both of them became even more flustered. Jessica was in stitches. Uh, m m mother Sorry, our conversation got complicated. I, I didn't notice. Oh, Ava-sama, my deepest apologies. It sounds like you young kids were getting really excited. You're all about that at that- You're all ab You're all about- Oh, okay. Psst, duh. You're all about that age. I remember, well, what's, what that's like. You must have no end of things like that to talk about. <laughs> Oh, come on, Auntie Ava, you're still in your prime. Please tell us how you and Uncle Hideyoshi met. Oh my, there's no way I can tell you that. <laughs> you're all so young. <laughs> so, what is it, Mother? You called because you wanted something, right? Your father and the rest have finished talking. We're going to talk about... We're going to talk to Grandfather about you, so come on. About me? What could that be? The same topic you all were just having. Remember that topic? Oh. Oh. That topic. That isn't really something we need to talk to Grandfather about, is it? What are you talking about? Wait, George Nissan, you aren't getting married to someone. Uh, congratulations. No, no. Uh, didn't I just say I don't have a special woman? That isn't something to brag about, is it? Seriously. Ava smiled bitterly, looking a little exasperated. Ah, I got it. George Nissan, it's one of those, right? A marriage meeting. Oh, a marriage meeting. Mm, well, yeah. <laughs> As a man, George undoubtedly wanted to find a partner by himself and carry her off himself, so it seems that he found the idea of meeting his partner for the first time in a marriage meeting arranged by his parents to be a little pathetic. Shouldn't marriage meetings be done at a more mature age? I still don't feel like I've become an adult. We don't intend on rushing you into an immediate engagement or marriage, of course not. It isn't a problem if you deepen your friendship first and then have her move to our family register later when you settle down as you age. From the forceful impression Ava was giving and George's evasiveness, it seemed you could catch a glimpse of how this marriage meeting linked into everything. Who this other person was remained unclear, but it was surely someone pr profitable to Ava's family in a business sense. It felt almost like a political strategy. They wanted to create a connection between the two families, if not by changing registers, then at least by having them get engaged. Marriage isn't something you do after you start liking someone. It's something you get used to after you do it. If you just marry based on emotions, you'll definitely regret it. There's definitely nothing wrong with choosing a person with a secure background as your partner in life and then building up emotions of love. Oh, Ava. Ava, you've got such a view on relationships. You've got such a view on relationships. Auntie Ava, that's so rude to Uncle Hideyoshi. <laughs> I love him, you know. I want to always be with him and to live my life by his side. Ava-sama, that's wonderful. Truly splendid. Thank you. But we built up those feelings while we were husband and wife, you see. And I believe that in the future we'll be much, much closer than we are now. I think that's the best way for a husband and wife to be. Although I don't think that makes it all right to marry someone you don't even like. And that doesn't make it all right to marry whoever you want just so long as you like them. A wedding only lasts a moment, but your life as a married couple after that is very, very long. So you should search with prudence and not leave it up to momentary emotions. And don't you think that your mother and the rest of us would be better at that than a person inexperienced in life such as yourself? That, that may be true, but... You're my pride and joy. My only son. You've grown into a fine man who could match up to anyone. And with Batlerkun leaving the register, you're the only grandson to carry father's blood. We must prudently choose a fitting pa partner for you. As everyone related to the Ushiromiya family knew, Ava adored George so much that he was the apple of her eye. But that didn't mean she had pampered him. She had raised him strictly, and had grown he had grown into a charming man who wouldn't betray her expectations. 
That's how he was the apple of her eye. We definitely aren't deciding your partner based on what we personally stand to gain from it. I'll introduce you to a truly wonderful woman who's right for you. Right now, you may still have some immature youth inside of you that's turning you away from this, but at least listen to what your mother says on this point. Have I ever failed to think of what's best for you? No, you haven't. That's all you need to think of for now. Come on, let's go. We're keeping father waiting. Hurry to the mansion. Well, sorry you two. See you later. George bowed to the two of them, and after bowing once more to Shannon, he dashed off to the mansion. I'll be going as well, then. Sorry for cutting your fun conversation short, Jessica-chan. Shannon-chan. Uh, no, no. Please, don't worry about it. Come on, Shannon. Let's go. Yes. It's all right. I'm sure you'll meet someone wonderful soon, too, Jessica-chan. A wonderful person suitable for you. So, if he's at the same level as me, <laughs> you mean a guy with bad grades? Well, that's kind of, that kind of freaking sucks. <laughs> and of course, you too, Shannon Chan. I'm sure that a wonderful man suitable for you will appear. I yes, thank you very much. As Ava giggled and smiled, she approached Shannon's ear with a hand over her mouth, as though she were trying to tell her a secret. I'm sure you'll find a perfect match for a lowly servant like yourself. Have you forgotten to be grateful for your schooling? Know your place. Th that's not what I... I... I didn't... George is the eldest grandson carrying father's blood. He's a person who may bear the burden of the Ashiramiya family someday in the future. To answer that expectation, he has studied tirelessly, entered a wonderful college, and is getting wonderful grades. Do you really think you're in his league, you incompetent, unqualified, uncultured servant? <laughs> Those malicious words all poured into Shannon's ear without spilling a drop. To Shannon, it was like a cold water being poured in there. I, I, I didn't mean... This was all whispered in secret, and with the same smile as before, Jessica, who could only see Ava's expression, didn't think it was anything other than Ava telling Shannon some embarrassing story about love. When their secret conversation ended, Ava patted Shannon's shoulders, as though to underscore her message. Don't worry. I'm sure that you'll find a partner just perfect for you. Right? <laughs> All right, Jessica-chan. See you later. Yeah, see you later. And then, please tell me some stories about you and Uncle Hideyoshi. No way. <laughs> Ava laughed dryly and headed back to the entrance hall. Behind Jessica, who was cheerfully waving her hand, Shannon reflected very, very deeply on those words of Ava's, about knowing her place. I felt deep remorse for my brief moment of conceit. I had forgotten... I'm furniture. Furniture isn't human. So I'm being, I'm a being who must feel gratitude for even being treated like a human. I'm not permitted to wish for anything more. Even if people develop affection for furniture that they're used to using, that's an emotion on the human side, and the furniture has no right to hope for that. They should just serve with simple honesty every day. But that feeling I felt when talking with George Sama and Jessica Sama is a forbidden drug for me. In other words, it may have been an emotion I must not know. Shannon, you've been too distracted for a while now. Are you feeling ill? N no, my apologies. Natsuhi's words, too distracted, were right on the mark. Even Shannon couldn't believe that she hadn't noticed Natsuhi until she had been called. This was supposed to be the time when she had to concentrate on cleaning. But she had just kept sighing and hadn't accomplished anything. Even if there aren't any guests, you must always be alert. Acting like that is shameful as a servant working for the Oshiramiya family. Yes. I'll take care from now on. The head and my husband will return very soon. Have you finished cleaning the study? Have you finished cleaning the staircase? My... My apologies. Not yet. Yes, I know. So I had Lunan do it. While you were plodding around cleaning the hallway, she finished cleaning the study and the staircase. That's because, um, I wanted to clean thoroughly, so it took some time. 
Shannon was simple and honest, so she would always carry out her tasks seriously and properly, without any omissions. So she was always slow with her work. In contrast, Lunon skillfully cut corners wherever they should be cut, so she could complete her jobs with a result that looked similar to an outsider, but in a much shorter time. In other words, she was shrewd. Compared to her, we should say that Shannon, who had just talked back to, Na talked back to Natsuhi when she was already in a bad mood, was not shrewd in the slightest. Of course, there was nothing that Natsuhi couldn't stand more than a servant talking back. Her forehead creased and she spoke sternly. And yet her speech was slow and admonishing, which was terrifying beyond measure, and finally made Shannon realize that she had said the wrong thing. I wouldn't say that it's a uh, June. Uh, I don't think it's at least six years in the past. Hey, have a good time recording uh, Higurashi Lambda. Thank you for joining. <clears throat> in that case, you shall clean as thoroughly as you desire. Shannon, I order you to clean the reception hall right now. It's an important hall where several pictures treasured by the head are displayed, and where honored guests of the Ushirimiya family are invited. Clean it thoroughly so that not a speck of dust remains, and so that even you are satisfied. Of course, you will finish today. Until you finish and report to me, you will not be permitted any food or rest. Understood? Uh, yes, madam. That's good. Servants should endeavor to use only their words. The next and to use only those words. The next time you talk back, I'll give you an even more severe punishment, so keep that in mind. Engrave these words in your heart. I yes, madam. Thank you for your guidance. You're welcome. Natsuhi headed off down the corridor, making a gesture as if her headache was troubling her. Once Shannon couldn't see her anymore, she hung her head and sighed. This happened because I let my thoughts take me. I might be bad at everything I do, but I should at least be able to carry out the cleaning as well as an average person can, right? I can't even do that properly. It's so pathetic it makes me cry. And there's something even more pathetic. Not only was I able to perform a single bit of cleaning well, but just now, when Natsuhi was scolding me, I was envisioning him appearing and rescuing me. If only George-sama had been here. Perhaps he would have casually stepped in and saved me. I'm sure he would show up cheerfully, intentionally acting like he doesn't know what's going on, nimbly change the subject and make me forget I was ever reprimanded by Natsuhi. I kept envisioning him, suddenly appearing from the other side of the door, or the other end of the hallway. I envisioned the kind of person that would be an appropriate partner for him in a marriage meeting, and I envisioned how unfitting I am for him. Ava had told me that clearly. It had endlessly repeated through my dreams. You're still as clumsy as ever, Nissan. Madam has been in a bad mood since this morning. You spoke out of turn when you should have hung your head in silence. Kanon can. Kanon was suddenly there. His footsteps were always quieter than a cat's, and he left no trace of his presence. She probably wouldn't have noticed him no matter how long he stood there. The expression on Kanon's face was... hatred. The, that expression he was making, he surely made for Shannon, who didn't know how to do so herself. Madame and Lunon can go to hell. She knows where Madame checks and only cleans those areas. Her cleaning just now was like that. I know because I was watching. She wasn't cleaning any real sense of the word. She's just the worst kind of parasite, leeching off of your thorough work. You mustn't use such dirty words. And dirty words pollute your clean soul, Kanonkun. So don't use those words in front of me, at least. All right? <laughs> Kanon faced away, acting sulkily. It was a dishonest reaction, very like Kanonkun. But I was a little happy. He got angry in my place. Cleaning the reception hall will be tough. I'll help. Thank you. But I was the one Madame ordered, so don't worry. Don't you also have your own work, Kanonkun? It's a filthy job. My soul was corrupted long ago. Kenon then hung his head and bit his lower lip. Just saying that you'll help is enough for me. If you don't go back to your own job, even you'll receive punishment. And that would make me sad. Shannon knew Kenon's character well. Sometimes he didn't reflect on himself. If I don't refuse forcefully, he'll help me, even if it means neglecting his own job. Kenon was a little sad that his favor had been rejected. But he realized that in the end, going too far would also cause her pain, 
and he gave a single, small sigh. Fine. Do your best, Nason. Yes. Besides, I'm also partly to blame. You aren't at fault at all, Nason. No, I am. So go now. Kenonkun's face showed that he still hadn't completely accepted it, but he stopped being persistent and disappeared. Even though Kanonkun had given me words of comfort when I was down, even so, I was still dejected because it hadn't been him. That was simply a sin. Far beyond any dreams the likes of me could be permitted to see. Know your place. Shannon, who had neglected breakfast, was already starting to feel- Oh wait, okay, that's just regular narrator. Was already starting to feel her thoughts attenuate. But if she didn't finish the cleaning the reception hall, she couldn't receive Natsuhi's permission to eat. That cruel Natsuhi had surely told the kitchen of that. I had to respectfully receive Madame's punishment. That's right. My position in the world is furniture, and I had been intoxicated by a dream that is beyond me. I finished cleaning the hallway and went to the reception hall. Maybe hunger makes a nose more sensitive. The kitchen was far away, but somehow I could smell the delicious aroma wafting from there, stimulating my empty stomach all the more. Until I finished up here, I could not get any soup. I just had to prepare myself. So we're gonna get, yeah. This is a, this is a good marker of the time. Remember that in episode one, they said that the portrait of Beatrice had been put up in the reception hall about two years ago. So we are somewhere in that range right now. <clears throat> Several portraits were hung in the reception hall. One of those portraits was thought amongst the servants to hold a special meaning. It was the portrait of, a, of the witch. That wasn't its true name, but everyone in the mansion called it that. The name of the woman with elegant blonde hair drawn as the subject of that portrait was Beatrice. It was whispered that she might be the former mistress of the family head, Kinzo and also that she was a great witch who had given Kinzo his legendary gold. The witch, Beatrice, master of the night of Onrokenjima. She was gracious to those who respected her, but she would always curse those who made light of her. It was in Shannon's character not to neglect rules and beliefs such as those. So she thought of the portrait as of her other master as that person herself, and always treated it carefully, treasuring it. And it had become part of her daily routine to talk inside her own head to the witch who only existed inside the portrait. She was furniture. Furniture doesn't complain, cannot complain. So she had no right to speak her mind about her difficult days, no right to open her mouth and say those words. So she at least spoke her mind inside her heart. Those words she couldn't say aloud, she spoke inside her heart and protested to the formless witch. Of course, the witch didn't answer. She never consoled and she never laughed it off. Shannon could only interpret that silence as she liked, as though the witch was at least listening attentively. Beatrice Sama, please listen to me, worthless as I am. As Shannon wiped the dust from the witch's portrait, she spoke inside her heart. Just as Eva Sama says, I truly am incompetent and uncultured furniture. I'm not a person, so maybe I have no right to love. But in that case, why was I given a heart which can know love? Shannon paused there and held back her tears for a time. The sound of the rain which had started falling, along with the chill air in the reception hall, made her feel as though her shabbiness had increased another level. Real furniture doesn't have a silly thing like a heart, so they don't have to love people, right? So they don't feel pain. If I'm just another piece of furniture, why do I have a heart? If it's going to be this hard and this painful, I wish I'd never been given this stupid heart. I see. To have given a heart to furniture. Amusing games that one plays sometimes. <laughs> the witch who never answered or laughed, answered and laughed. My imagination? Hearing things? No. After all, the next words became a voice, and I could hear them, not with my heart, but with my ears. Humans have been continually searching for the elements that make up the world since before the Christian era. It is said that the ancient Greeks tried explaining the world with the four elements of air, fire, water, and earth. And after that, over several millennia, humans added several elements to those four. 
trying to explain the world with a host of interpretations. The five elements, the six elements, the seven elements, the eight elements, the twelve elements. But they could never explain the one true, single element. However, a single man appeared by the guidance of a star, and finally explained the single element that makes up the world. Do you know what it is? What? Who? Shannon fearfully turned around. Right there, she existed. Not as an illusion, in reality. The contrast made by the lightning made it clear that this was not just a daydream. It is love. <laughs> the witch of the portrait elegantly held a golden pipe to her mouth and giggled. She laughed at the ignorance which caused mankind's thoughts to stray far from the most simple answer. That man ex- that man- bleh. That man explained everything in the world with love. That is the single element. With the smallest possible number, that man fully explained how the world was constructed. How simple and clear. How splendid, exhilarating, pleasant, and thrilling. The year that man was born eventually- That man was born eventually became- Came to be known as a- Pfft. Fuck. Anno Domini. Shannon lost any words to speak. She thought that when a, first meeting an unknown guest, her first word should be to ask that person's name. But without saying anything, Shannon knew this person's name, so she refrained. No, surely, as a person of this island, asking this person for her name would be the greatest disrespect. Because she was the other master of this island, in addition to Kinzo, but Beatrice Summer. Indeed. The Golden Witch, who has lived for a thousand years, she has already surpassed the limits of humans, and it is said that she will appear in response to a human summons, just as demons do, to lend them her power for a price. Likes black tea and ice cream, hates boredom, and those who deny her existence. Uh, any advice for becoming a voice actress doing impressions? Honestly, the way I uh, did it, like the way that I built up uh, was basically just doing a bunch of fan projects and impressions for fun whenever I was like a 10 year old until now. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're bad at it at first. That's, that's my best advice. Just keep doing it um, and put everything you have into it. Um, and don't worry about being cringe, because eventually that cringe will transform into talent. <laughs> <clears throat> I am Beatrice. The face people make when they first see me hasn't changed after 1,000 years. <laughs> the witch giggled at how Shannon's reaction didn't betray her expectations. Shannon realized that she had met with a being that mustn't be met with, and she took a step backwards. That's where the wall and the portrait were, so even as she gazed at the witch, she supported the witch's portrait on her back. Your worries are due to love, which is the single element of the world. In other words, everything of this world. When that is not whole, it means the world is not whole. It is like continually scooping water into a flask with a hole in it. Even if you scoop and scoop, it is never filled, an eternal desert of the heart. The original sin that humans are founded upon and everything is made of. Understand? What Adam and Eve learned when they put the fruit of knowledge to their lips was love. Because of that, humans were chased out of paradise and became human. What mean, what, which means that what makes one human is knowing love and suffering. Uh, remember what Shannon was saying when she was about to uh, break the mirror? About uh, leaving paradise and becoming human? <clears throat> I just thought that was interesting. Girl of kind heart, you should be proud. Now that you have known it, you are no longer furniture. Now you are human. I recognize that upon my name. Uh, um, <laughs> is it hard for an inferior being to understand? Oh well. <laughs> Forgive me. It's been a long time since I've spoken with a human. I shall apologize for my talkativeness. Without expecting a reply from Shannon, Beatrice laughed pleasantly for a while. I'm not sure that this is sufficient for an apology, but I can use my powers to grant that desires, desire of yours, if you'd like. Huh? The meaning of those words surprised Shannon even more than the witch's sudden appearance. I'm offering to bring you and the one you love together. Normally, I would demand something of equal value in return. 
<laughs> I'm in a good mood, and you've never failed to pay your respects to me in the past. That is something worth rewarding. Do you, you really mean it? Normally, Shannon would have been shocked by this guest who lacked realism and wouldn't have been able to speak. However, as though she had already been caught in the witch's trap, Shannon responded to the witch. With my magic, it is no doubt, it is no trouble at all to arrange for a people with feelings for each other to be joined. You do mean it, don't you? Those words almost escaped Shannon's lips, but she held herself back with her final reserves of reason. A witch is a witch, a sinister being. The witch Beatrice is clearly trying to slip in through the cracks in my heart and take me prisoner. That sort of temptation, which so many fairy tale picture books had warned me about when I was younger, was right in front of me now. Fear, too, is a form of respect. It may be pleasant for me, but will make no progress this way. I may be no different than the image of a detestable witch that you humans hold in your mind. However, I respond with goodwill to those who respect me. Aren't humans the same? Although I doubt any human would respond with goodwill to a hostile attitude like that. M my apologies. I didn't mean... Shannon finally realized that her, her hostility was rude to this guest. And she di fully, finally digested the words that had been spoken to her a short while ago. You are no longer furniture. Now, you are human. The more she reflected upon those words, the more Shannon felt as though Beatrice could understand all of her suffering. You said something, um, about a reward. What did you mean? I say that I can arrange for you to be bound to the man who has captured your heart. You can think of it as a form of gratitude for diligently polishing my portrait all the time. Calm yourself. I ask for nothing in return. I'm generous. However, though I ask for nothing in return, I do have a request. Look, here it comes. The other Shannon inside her heart sent her a warning. This is what she had been so often warned of in all those scary picture books she had read when she was little. Do you know the small tori and shrine that have been constructed on a reef in the ocean very near this island? Shannon immediately remembered it. When you reached Rukenjima by boat, there was a tori and a shrine on a reef which was too small to be even called an islet. She had the feeling that Kumasawa had told her its history, but she couldn't remember that very well. A traveling mountaineering ascetic, I don't know, or someone had built it, or prayed at it, or something. Yes, I know about it, but what does that... I will not explain everything from square one to a person who does not know of demons. To make a long story short, it's causing problems for me. There's actually a certain mirror kept inside that shrine. The first C is silent. I say, okay, so it's like ascetic. Ascet ascetic? Yeah, okay. Interesting. <clears throat> I want you to break it. That was a very suspicious request. Shannon didn't know its history, but anything that might be stored inside a shrine would have to be something sacred. And she wants me to break it? Why would someone as powerful as a witch be unable to do that herself and be asking a human for help? There was no need for Shannon to speak her thoughts aloud. Beatrice started talking about this reasonable request before Shannon could give her an answer. The power of the magic power of that mirror opposes my own. I cannot explain it well with human words. By way of example, let us speak of the differences between utensils. That mirror is a fork and my power is soup. You cannot drink soup with a fork, correct? If only the imposition of that mirror were gone, I could prepare a spoon perfect for drinking soup. If only I had that, I could drink soup or even dig my way out of a rocky prison. I could even scoop eye eyeballs out. Is that what it was? <laughs> so, uh, for those of you who don't remember, because it's been a hot minute, the thing that she just said about how you can use a spoon to eat soup or dig yourself out of a prison or scoop out eyeballs is something that Burn Castell said in the Hidden Tea Party at the very end of episode one. <clears throat> I... I don't know what you're talking about. If that's because I'm uncultured, I apologize. It comes down to this. If you spare the effort to break that most vexing of mirrors for me, as a reward, I will grant your wish. I'm in a very good mood today. If you desire, you may change your wish, and I can give you all of the gold I bestowed upon Kinzo. <laughs> I... I will have to decline. What did you say? 
When she heard Shannon's words, Beatrice realized for the first time that her expectations had been betrayed. If there's a reason, tell me. If there's a misunderstanding, I shall resolve it. I... I don't really know the reason. But until today, the island has been at peace, and nothing bad has happened. So even if I don't break the mirror, the peace that has existed until today should continue into the future. Hmm. I see, I see. That's quite right. It's just as you say. If you don't break it, the same unbreakable days that have passed until today will continue until tomorrow and the day after. Why don't I give you an absolute guarantee? Upon my name of Beatrice, I say to you, the same unbreakable days that have passed until today will continue until tomorrow and the day after, and so forever in perpetuity. Shannon was seized by an eerie illusion. The mirror was most likely something to restrain the witch. So breaking the mirror would have done something for the witch's sake. And yet, felt as though Shannon had to do it for her own sake. It felt like some premise had been switched. I have done nothing more than give you the opportunity to have your feelings fulfilled as a reward. It's up to you whether you break it or not. If you break it, I will grant your wish. If you do not break it, the tomorrows up until today will continue for all time. Your wish will not be granted for all eternity. Do you understand? What I, what I am saying? <laughs> The witch was telling her. She was pressing her, saying to break the mirror if she wanted to be joined with George. And she was declaring that if she didn't break it, then her feelings would definitely never be fulfilled. Please, stop it. I don't want to hear something like that. To cause you pain was not what I wanted. Well, feeling madness from love is the best thing about humans. You should enjoy that emotion to your heart's content. However, if you wish to borrow my power, you can break that mirror at any time. And you can yell my name and awaken me. I will definitely keep my promise. This way, you should have no complaints, right? I won't force you to decide right now. I, I take it that that is easier for you? Was this deal ultimately something she could feel at ease with? Definitely not. To Shannon, who was burning with love, tormented by passion, being tempted forever by a way of escape was far too cruel a trial. I won't set a time limit on that promise, but there is a time limit on the magic that can grant that wish. That limit is not mine to determine. It will be determined by your loved one himself. Do you understand what I mean? I... I don't know. The limit is the time your loved one chooses the person he should pledge his love to. I'm a witch, but I'm not a demon. I possess no spell which can tear apart two who love each other, you see. <laughs> I hear that your loved one will soon be attending a marriage meeting. You may have stronger feelings for that man than anyone else in the world. However, that doesn't mean that you're the most appropriate for him, does it? I know who he will be having that marriage meeting with. That girl is the most suitable for Ushiramiya George in the entire world. She came from a good school, achieved good grades, and has composure and prudence. She's more beautiful than you, wiser than you, more suitable than you. Why would an ignorant, incompetent, uncultured girl like you be suitable? You know better than anyone. You are the most unsuitable. Even imagining that you and Ushiramiya George could be joined is sinful and foolish. Foolish, foolish, foolish! Know your place! Have you forgotten to be grateful for your schooling? Know your place. George is the eldest grandson carrying father's blood. He's a person who may bear the burden of the Ushiramiya family someday in the future. To answer that expectation, he has tri studied tirelessly, entered a wonderful college, and is getting wonderful grades. Do you really think you're in his league, you incompetent, unqualified, uncultured servant? <laughs> S stop it! Don't bully Shannon! Who the hell are you? At that time, as Shannon held her head, trying to protect her heart from the blade of Beatrice's words, Canon ran in front of her. Canon, who didn't care, didn't care who this woman was. As long as he knew she was an enemy tormenting Shannon, who he loved and respected as a sister, nothing else mattered. Canon kun stay back. This person is... <laughs> it seemed that Canon also realized that this being standing before him was with the witch of the portrait, and also that she was a terrifying being.
I just wanted to make T Shannon taste and take her reward. But it seems I said too much and ended up tormenting her. I shall apologize. But I will leave that promise as a reward to you. If you need my power, call me at any time. I have already told you how. Well then, with that, let us disperse for tonight. Hostile gazes may be pleasant, but they're bad for the figure, you see. <laughs> Beat it. I don't know who you are, but you're threatening Shannon. Don't ever show yourself again. It seemed that Canon's words made the witch horribly displeased. So you do not choose your words carefully, Lowborn. I'm gracious to those who respect me, but brutal to those who do not. While she still smiled, the witch's expression began to warp, and an oppressive feeling that couldn't be described with any of the five senses gradually filled the room. Even though they couldn't comprehend what it was, they immediately realized it to be something terrifying. If you were swimming in the ocean, and something large went by in the water beneath you, you would want to escape to the land even before you learned what it was. This was the same as that. Please, stop! Beatrice Sama! Kyanon Kun is still a child! I apologize for his language. <laughs> Kyanon blocked the way to Shannon at the risk of his life. There was a tense sweat on his forehead. In that, mom in that moment, the witch certainly had Kyanon's fate in her clutches. She didn't even need to move a finger. She had Kanon's fate so readily in her grasp that she could crush it completely with a single twist of her own smile. Kanon also, also understood that, which is why he was sweating, and his knees felt weak. However, Beatrice abruptly released that feeling of tension and laughed. Very well. At your request, I will grant him special pardon. Kanon, is it? In deference to her, I shall forgive you tonight and send you off. Be thankful. Well then, we disperse for tonight. In parting, I shall leave you a single souvenir. Hold out the palms on the left on your left hands, you two. Beatrice grinned broadly and snapped her fingers. Whereupon their left hands stretched out in front of them and their palms opened against their will. It was a strange sensation, as though only their left hands had become someone else's. It felt like their left hands alone had become puppets, pulled by strings hanging down from the ceiling. What do you think you're doing? Kenon resisted, but he couldn't take back the freedom of his left hand. Don't struggle. It will not take long. Beatrice held her pipe aloft, and from inside the smoke, gold-colored sparkling dust hovered in the air. That glitter eventually became several gold butterflies. The beautiful butterflies danced freely throughout the reception hall, creating a fantastical and beautiful world and two of those butterflies alighted on the palm of Shannon's and Canon's hands. Hmm? Ouch! There was a sharp pain, as though they had been burned. When the two of them tried to examine their palms, there was no trace left of that inability to move their bodies, which had been there until a second ago. A, a bruise? What is? On the palm of her hand, a small burn mark had been made, the size of a pea. Furthermore, it was shaped like a butterfly. What is this supposed to be? Apparently, Canon had the same bruise on his hand. He stared at the witch hatefully. It is a simple greeting. I have no hidden motive. It is nothing more than a bruise, so it will heal in just a few days. It requires no treatment. That is a mark so that tomorrow you will not forget that I truly was here and that I made a promise with you. The impact of a meeting with me is strong. Sometimes, at the next morning, people try to think of their meeting with me as a dream or an illusion. You should think slowly and carefully, Shannon. And you should probably take a good rest, look at my mark tomorrow morning, and try thinking again. I shall not force you into anything. You should freely decide your future by your own will. However, to think that the object of your desire can be granted for such meager compensation, it would annoy the great artists who write plays about blighted love to no end. <laughs> well then, let us meet again when the chance arises. It truly was entertaining to have a conversation again after so much time. Farewell, furniture. <laughs> Beatrice's body crumbled like smoke and blew away. It was golden smoke. No, a flight of golden butterflies. They scattered in all directions inside the reception hall, leaving a golden mist behind as they disappeared into thin air. After that, only the cold silence was left. The extreme silence was enough to make both of them think that they might have been daydreaming until just a moment ago. 
which is why the witch had left it. She had left a mark to make it impossible for them to think it was a daydream. As Shannon and Cannon thought back on the butterfly bruises on their hands and the pain they had felt when those had been left, they stood there for some time stunned and motionless. And from that day on, Shannon was tormented by days of suffering and conflict. separate rooms. Then Shannon, you and George Nissan, Nissan stayed in different rooms on purpose? Uh, yes. Um, was it that strange of a thing to do? Since Jessica's cheeks had been stuffed with chocolate-coated Chinsuko biscuit that Shannon had brought as a souvenir from Okinawa, it all flew out at Shannon when Jessica cried out. Okay, so we're jumping forward in time again. Uh, this is after the date that you saw at the aquarium at the beginning of the episode. Shannon, why did you even go on a trip to Okinawa then? And even alone with George Nissan. That's because, I mean, since there's a very big aquarium in Okinawa, I was invited to go, and I like fish and stuff. No, I mean, like, this is a young couple going on an overnight trip, right? And you're saying there wasn't even hugs and kisses? To say nothing of the fact that the guy and girl were staying in different rooms. As for kisses, no comment. Uh, but we did hug, though. And George's son, George's son's chest was warm. Uh, that's not the point. Ah, uh, jeez. Why do couples like this exist? Ah, uh, jeez. It's so damn irritating. From Shannon's perspective, a lot, of, a lot of things had happened, and it seemed to have been a very happy trip. But it looked like the missed opportunity had left Jessica feeling greatly unfulfilled. For a while, Jessica chewed on her souvenir, writhing on her bed as she complained about their romance. Shannon and George had chosen to go to Okinawa because there was a huge aquarium there. That was because their first meeting had revolved around an aquarium. Since they had started at an aquarium, having their first overnight trip also be to an aquarium must have held some commemorative value. This was your special commemorative trip, your turning point, your first overnight trip. Shouldn't there have been all kinds of progress? And yet, separate rooms for the guy and girl? A couple taking two single rooms? Ah, oh, jeez, really? What's wrong with you? Um, but we're both single. George son says that respecting boundaries is a good manners between men and women. Uh, for hell's sake, this overnight trip was so you could overcome that, wasn't it? Uh, you're not the stage of mere hugs and kisses anymore. M Milady, I don't know what you mean by that, but... George Sama was a real gentleman with me until the end. That is, I mean, I also wondered if those things would happen, you know. But we may be going out, but... I mean, it's not as if we're married or anything. The kind of things you seem to be expecting, my lady. I mean, we must do so only after we properly make a vow in front of God, and, um... We mustn't... Uh... Shannon's face was bright red. She was restlessly fidgeting, making a circle with both hands, then a chain link, continually intertwining, separating and making heart shapes with them. Yeah, Jessica, stop reading fanfiction. <laughs> Apparently, the dramatic progress Jessica had looked forward to hadn't happened. But it seemed that it had been a very important experience for Shannon in her own way. So in the end, no matter how much Jessica envied Shannon or made fun of her, it didn't change the fact that Shannon had a huge lead on her. Ugh, I want a boyfriend too. I can't believe you beat me to it. We promised we'd get boyfriends at the same time, but you snuck ahead and beat me. Ah! Uh, um... Milady, you're a wonderful person, so I'm sure you'll find someone even more wonderful than I did before long. Don't try to console me. Shannon, you traitor, get out of here! You suck! <coughs> <coughs> Jessica threw several cushions at her, but midway she had an asthma attack and started to cough pretty badly. Shannon hurriedly ran over to her and took a, and took a look on top of the nearby side table. An adorable basket was placed there, and inside of it was Jessica's inhaler. Shannon picked it up and handed it over to Jessica. Jessica's asthma attacks always came suddenly. Because of this, she always had to carry this medicine around with her at all times. She breathed in the medicine, and after some time spent holding back her coughing, her asthma finally settled down. 
Shannon thought this a good chance to leave, bowed courteously, and made to exit the room. As she did, one more small cushion came flying and hit Shannon on the head. <laughs> My god. She looked around and saw that Jessica was on the verge of crying, half of her face buried in her last and favorite cushion. That face was red and meek. M lady Shannon, be honest with me. Is my hairdo and stuff strange? What are you saying? I think that your hair is very beautiful. Then, then are my eyes strange? Or, or maybe my nose? Or, or is it the way I talk after all? Is that why I can't get a boyfriend? Of course not. Milady, you're wonderful enough as you are, and I think that your charm will keep increasing more and more. But it's only me who can't get a boyfriend. Saku and Hina managed to find one, but I can't. I'm the only one. It's because I don't have any charm. Is it because I don't have any charm after all? Hey, welcome Sailor Saturn to becoming a channel member. Thank you. You know, everyone's going to be bringing their boyfriend along to the cultural festival. I was so sure I'd have a boyfriend by then. I've been grandstanding about it. But I can't get a boyfriend to save my life. I'm the only one. The only one. Before she realized it, Jessica was shedding huge tears. Jessica hadn't really planned on crying. And of course, she felt like supporting Shannon's progress in love as a friend. However, as she had made fun of Shannon, her true feelings had suddenly gotten mixed in, and the tears had just poured out on their own. Shannon understood Jessica's innocent and easily injured heart. Jessica's usual rough style of speech was all just an attempt to protect her own easily injured heart. As a daughter and successor to the Yashiramiya family, and as a girl isolated on Rokenjima, the only person she could expose her true feelings to was Shannon. Shannon understood that, so she strongly regretted feeling a little too self-satisfied. Sorry, crying like this. I'm weird. Sorry. You're a wonderful person, milady. There's no way that a nice man wouldn't appear for you. Shannon, it's about time for you, right? If you don't go soon, Genji-san and Mom are gonna yell at you. I'm totally fine, so get going. <laughs> Sorry for crying like this. I'm such a moron. Jessica faced away as if to show she wasn't looking for attention, and waved her hand as though to drive Shannon away. Shannon took that as a sign that she didn't want to be badgered anymore, bowed her head, and left the room. When her footsteps disappeared into the distance, Jessica lay down on her bed, still hugging the cushion. Her expression was a little meek, with tears in her eyes. But for the first time in a long time, she had a very, very quiet and honest conversation with her heart. I also want to fall in love. As Shannon watered the flower beds in the garden in high spirits, she sensed someone's presence. She turned around, thinking that if one of the family had come to visit, she must greet them. And what she saw was that witch. But Beatrice Sama. It's been quite some time. How are you? Has your relationship with your special person progressed since last time? As Beatrice sat on the rose arch, she happily blew on her pipe. Sitting in a place like that would crush the roses, and it might have been dangerous if you fell off the arch. But after all, this was a witch. That was surely an unnecessary concern. I yes. Thanks to you, it's going smoothly. Naturally, my magic is instantaneous. You may even begin feeling as if your meeting was a predetermined fate. But that isn't correct. Don't think for a moment this has anything to do with fate. Uh, I understand that. The witch was calling attention to something. Two things, actually that originally her relationship with George had been completely impossible, and that her magic power was so great it could manipulate that fate. Shannon had become swept up in these sweet days and had started to fall under the illusion that all fate was revolving around her. But the witch's words made her remember. Her relationship with George had originally been impossible, 
No, might also be impossible in the future as well. <laughs> sorry, sorry. It's just like a doctor. Even though you rely on them when you worry about their, your health, after you're healed, you forget even to thank them. Witches have never known thanks, so I couldn't help acting a little rudely. Forgive me. Will this stream go on as long as the first stream of Chapter 1 did? Uh, no. Definitely not. <laughs> I have never forgotten my feelings of gratitude. I was able to achieve happiness thanks to your power, Beatrice Sama. And without that power, George Sama and I would have had no fate together. I've never forgotten that. Sorry, sorry. This was not my intent. I didn't come here to bully you. Talking rudely is just my personality. Do forgive me. More importantly, I heard it through the grapevine. You two went on a little trip. I'm sure it was quite fun. Yes. It was, um, very fun. Shannon's face grew sudden, bleh, suddenly grew bright. The witch laughed lightly, as though that transformation was worth money. Already the person of your thoughts is no longer an object of one-sided love. You're a pair of lovers now. To a pair filled with love, that alone is all they need in the world. A wonderful ideal thought, so to speak. <laughs> Even witches would be jealous. Beatrice laughed pleasantly. That smile was without a trace of malice, making her look as though she'd blessed the lover's secret meeting from the bottom of her heart. After that, Beatrice had shown herself before Shannon every once in a while. Every, even now, Shannon still thought of her as a creepy being. However, she was also hugely indebted to this person for bestowing the magic that had given her the relationship she had with George. So Shannon was trying with all her might not to be surprised or scared. Oh, oh yes. Um, Beatrice Sama, I brought some confectionery as a souvenir from our trip. Would you, um, like some? Ho? Oh? A souvenir for a witch? It seemed that even the witch, who boasted of living for 1,000 years, hadn't been able to predict that she would receive a souvenir from a pair of sweet lovers. When she saw that surprised expression, Shannon thought of the witch as a friend for the first time. <laughs> Oriental cookies made from wheat flour and lard. To wrap that in chocolate in the Western fashion is truly a blending of Japanese and Western style. The Silk Road of confectionery. What? What's so funny? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> My apologies. This mysterious witch, who surely held a terrifying power, was chomping down on the treats one after another, making a sound like a squirrel stuffing walnuts into its mouth. After a while, Shannon couldn't conceal her laughter. Hmm. A fine treat. I should serve you some... Um, Dolce Vita? I, uh, I think that's how you say it? Dolce Vita? I should ser serve you some Dolce Vita from Nero one of these days. Roses are the symbol of eternal love. I believe a rose dolce, rose dolce would be appropriate for you right now. The witch was in a great mood, having enjoyed the modern treats to the full. Um, here. I truly can't thank you enough. I believe you've done more than enough for me already, so I'm returning this. Yes, that's correct. Okay, cool. The thing that Shannon had softly set on the table was a gold-colored but butterfly brooch. There's no need to return it. If you continue holding that, your relationship should remain firm in perpetuity. I may have been given the chance to meet him through the power of magic, but I think that, that the effort that will make that, that encounter eternal should come from the two of us cooperating together. Hmm. So love, too, is like a rose. Too much fertilizer causes the roots to rot. Some flowers cannot be raised without hard work. In that case, do as you wish. You may keep it in a box rather than on your person. That's my goodwill given to you. It would not, not please me to have it returned. Uh, my apologies. That's not what I... <laughs> no harm has been done. That brooch is already yours. If you treasure that as proof of our friendship, that would comfort me a little. You may hold on to it and gain its benefits. You may also keep it in the box. If you wish, you are free to even give it to another who is worrying about love. Oh, it's pronounced brooch. Yeah, you're right. I always get confused by the spelling. <clears throat> but you should regard it as important. It would certainly pain my heart if you did not take care of it. According to Beatrice, she had appeared several times in the past in response to a person's summons, so she could give them an item imbued with some kind of magic power. 
However, most of them, after they used that power to resolve their worries, would quickly come to think of that power as creepy, and forgetting their feelings of things, they would throw away the items that they had been given with disgust. Which is why I, hadn't often I haven't often received thanks for my goodwill. Let's see, is this the first time? <laughs> the witch laughed heartily, but it looked like a sad laugh to Shannon's eyes. She herself had been like that in the past. No, maybe she was still like that now. Where the hell is Battler? Uh, Battler's chilling out with his mom's parents. He's not here yet. He hasn't come back yet. This is before uh, the family conference. <clears throat> God, why is my chair? Hold on. <clears throat> okay. Beatrice was definitely a witch with a strange and terrifying power. Most likely, no one would go along with her if they could help it. And even though on occasion they had relied on her strange power, it had undoubtedly resulted in fear more often than gratitude. It must have deeply hurt the witch when that repeated over and over. From the moment that she had realized this, Shannon decided to stop being frightened of Beatrice. That had surely tormented her for over a thousand years. Maybe she really liked the treats. Beatrice, who normally spoke abusively, praised the black tea that Shannon served her and looked to be in remarkably high spirits. On such terms, the witch and the servants grew animated talking about the trip with George. Shannon didn't know much about Beatrice. First off, she was a ghost-like being who appeared in unexpected places and unexpected times, and it seemed that not everyone could perceive that she was there. It seemed that each person had something called a wavelength and that there was a great amount of individual variation in people's ability to perceive a witch. Only Shannon and Canon could interact with her enough to exchange words like this. There were a few people who could sense her presence, but most people couldn't even feel that much. From what Beatrice said, Krauss and his wife in particular had zero magical talent. And no matter how much she followed them around, they would never notice her. Previously, when Shannon had messed up and Natsuhi had gotten really mad at her, Beatrice had started playing around, hitting Natsuhi on the head with her pipe. Indeed, Natsuhi seems completely oblivious. But Shannon, watching that, had burst out laughing without thinking, and had gotten scolded even more. Then, what about the Master? I hear that he's been doing research in magic, so I'm sure he would be able to notice you, Beatrice Sama. Kinza was the same. There's no one with a more pitiful lack of magical talent. It's the blood. You know, so little talent is worthy of sympathy. Hmm? As soon as they started talking about Kinzo, it felt like the atmosphere around Beatrice had changed. She had spoken about Kraus and the rest's lack of magical talent as though she looked down on them, but she spoke of Kinzo in a different way. Anyone connected to the Yoshiramiya family would know about Kinzo's legend of the gold. According to the legend, Kinzo had summoned the witch Beatrice and had been conferred gold. In short, that implied that she had some kind of relationship with Kinzo. So you see, he attained that level despite not having a single scrap of talent. It was through frenzied solitary study that he reached the tier of mage. That's something really incredible, right? Mm-hmm. The witch, who usually looked down on people, was unexpectedly praising someone. While she lambasted Kinzo, calling him talentless, she praised his efforts. And then, the master summoned you with the power of magic. Mm-hmm. Well, I only answered on the summons on a whim. In this period, where magic had long, has long since been denied, there I saw a being without a scrap of talent giving it his all. It was just my luck that I decided to come and laugh at him. <laughs> the words just my luck showed that this had been a disaster for her. Shannon hesitated over whether it would be all right to encourage her to continue, but Beatrice continued on her own, ignoring Shannon. The format and rules were all there, at least. He'd mixed up a few of the procedures, but, well, in deference to his enthusiasm, I generously responded to his contract, and I gave him a mountain of gold. Then the master used that gold and succeeded in business, and grew his wealth into what it is today. Hmm. His talent in magic was nothing, but it seems he had talent in business and gambling. Or was it because of his bravery and madness to stake everything on irrational bets? Madness sometimes brings about magic. Yes. If I look at it that way, maybe I can't really say that Kinzo had absolutely no magical talent. 
Shannon felt like she was daydreaming. While everyone in the Ushirimiya family knew of the story that Kinzo had delved into sorcery, summoned a witch, and been given gold, in actuality it was all rambling that no one believed in. And now, the witch herself was telling her that it was true. Shannon felt a little flustered at this insane secret that only she knew. Then Kinzo, who had obtained a vast fortune, satisfied his every dream that could be granted in the human world. And finally, he sought the truth of the world. The truth of the world? The single element that makes up the world. Kinzo, who had achieved everything one can obtain in the human world, wanted that. The final desire humans seek. The single element. She felt like she had heard the witch say those words before. When Beatrice saw Shannon trying to remember what that was, she smiled awkwardly, waving her hand and saying there was no need to remember. I underestimated Kinzo a trifle. I truly hadn't thought he would display such power. And thanks to that, I'm in this state. I've been sewn in place on this island for several decades now without even a friend to drink tea with. My voice reaches none I call out to, and I cannot go anywhere. Such boring decades. As she laughed in self-derision, she tapped her teacup with her finger. It made the clear sound of porcelain. Shannon didn't know whether the word self-derision was really an accurate expression to describe the look on the witch's face. Shannon didn't understand everything, but she could more or less figure out the situation. And it was surely a topic that she would not press the witch on lightly, unless the witch started talking about it herself. To sum up everything she had said until now, Beatrice, who had been summoned by Kinzo's magic, could not leave this island for some reason, and she had lost her power and her form, living her days in boredom. During that time, her words had reached Shannon, who never forgot to strongly respect the witch, and she had made Shannon to help regain her power, even if only a little bit of it. As a result, she had been able to drink tea with Shannon like this. I am, can I just say, I am loving the way I am seeing the chat's opinions on characters bounce around. Like, I, I'm, I'm just, I love it. I love seeing you guys go from like, scary Beatrice, funny hot lady to be like, oh, she's kind of sad. I feel sad for her. It's so good. This is the kind of stuff that uh, that uh, Umineko fans live for, seeing other people react to. I'm just, I, I, won't, I won't try to get into it much more than that, but just know that you are doing exactly what I want right now. <laughs> Beatrice-sama, what in the world was that mirror that you told me to break? Ah, that topic. It seems that a lot of things happened on the islands around this area, in the distant past. Bad things gather due to that, attracting bad distortions. It seems that a traveling eastern mage or someone built a shrine for the repose of souls and sealed them in there. <laughs> Sorry, I got distracted by, is Kinzo a yandere thread locked after 1,790 pages of heated debate? <laughs> um, yes, the answer is yes, that's my answer. <clears throat> That in itself had nothing to do with me, but unfortunately the foundation of that magical power was different. It created a strong interference with my own magic and was extremely bothersome. Is that how it was? I just assumed that it had been sealing you, Beatrice-sama. I was not its target, but it was a divine mirror. As a result, my power was sealed away. If I were to use food as an example, maybe it would go something like this. Let's say that I've ordered some Western cuisine, which is being made in the kitchen. However, when it comes time for it to be served, the seating is in Japanese style, and the Japanese tableware has been laid out. So the kitchen is unable to take out the plate which would have been out of place, and no matter how long I wait, my Western food won't arrive. Something like that. So I had to destroy that Japanese style seating and return the area to a blank slate for a time. Thanks to that, the meal I had ordered was finally delivered and my power came back, you would say. However, so far, only the aperitif has arrived. Is that how you pronounce it? Aperitif? Aperitif? Bleh. I don't know. Beatrice, stop using words that I don't understand. <laughs> or can't pronounce, rather. Um, <clears throat> by the way, this would actually probably be a good um, point to point out, uh, because I'm not playing with the Japanese uh, voice acting on, obviously, so you can't hear it. Aperitif. Okay. Um... But yeah, uh, Beatrice has a very particular way of speaking um, in the Japanese. She is constantly speaking in a, in a very refined, almost regal kind of sounding speech. Uh, and she uses warawa as a personal pronoun, which is extremely old 
um, very like almost like like the way a, a lord would refer to themselves or like an ancient being is how it's often used in anime and stuff um, which is appropriate for a witch um, but yeah is uh, she speaks as though she is displaced out of time uh, she very much speaks as though she is from like thousands of years ago yes <clears throat> And she's just, like, talking to this teenager in the 80s, which is really funny. <laughs> it will be still be quite some time before the main dish. Uh, like saying thy, thou, etc. Sort of similar to that, yeah. As I am now, I'm even more faint than a fairy in a shoe store. <laughs> <laughs> What's so funny? <laughs> Nothing. I was just thinking witches' analogies are so interesting. I never thought you could use food as an analogy to talk about magic. I had just thought it to be a skillful description, if I do say so myself, and I certainly did not imagine that it would be laughed at. I feel a little offended. A slightly sulky expression rose to the witch's face. It would not have been a strange expression at all to see appear on the face of two friends as they enjoyed their tea. Although I may not look it, I was known for doing extremely brutal things in the past gotten soft. Now I can even have a foolish discussion while drinking tea with a human. Uh, Menlo Marseilles, $5. Beatrice's dialogue keeps orbiting back to love. Whatever Kinzo in his obsession did to her, I feel like it made a mark on how she thinks about the topic. That is a very good observation. And I think you are on a correct track. So definitely people should keep thinking about that. <clears throat> Just gonna wait for that donation message to appear in 500 years from now on the screen for some reason. She was probably talking to herself. As Beatrice gazed at the sea, at the seabirds tracing the horizon, she put her tea to her lips again. The clouds have come out. When the ocean loses its brilliance, it's nothing more than a gray puddle. You think so? I think the ocean's a beautiful deep blue, even if it gets cloudy. Maybe the witch had noticed the deep meaning behind Shannon's words. She laughed lightly and set down her empty teacup. It seems that those things buried in your eyes aren't black pebbles anymore. So, do you understand the feeling of furniture being reborn as a human? Yes. I didn't know that the world was this kind. Since her relationship with George had begun, Shannon's face had grown brighter more often. Her smile had made everything go smoothly, and had even changed her luck. Shannon made fewer mistakes in her work than she had before, and the family member's opinion of her was starting to change slightly. Just the other day, Krauss, who rarely exchanged words with her, had suddenly started talking to her, surprising her. You've been making a good smile more often lately, haven't you? Has something good happened? Uh, no, but every day is fun, yes. Hmm. Is that, isn't that good to hear? Coffee is obviously more delicious, delicious if it's poured with a smile. Could I ask for another cup with... That smile again? Yes. That had become a chance for Shannon to gain confidence in herself. Of course, it didn't go beyond her own heart, and it wasn't so big a change that everyone could see it. Yeah, there we go. Finally appeared. <clears throat> but she had begun to change, bit by bit. Shannon understood it clearly. To know love was to gain a soul and therefore to be born again from furniture to a human. There was absolutely nothing mistaken in Beatrice's words. By knowing love, Shannon had learned what it meant to, what it was to be human. These have been unusual snacks. It was time well spent. It's probably about time for you to return to your work. Let us end our part and tea party now. After all, it seems there are some who dislike your drinking tea with me, you see. Hmm? The witch gripped a teaspoon and flipped it with her fingers, sending it up in the air. Then, it was flicked by the fingers of some invisible person in empty space and flew straight into a bush close nearby. The bush moved violently, and Cannon came out. It seems that he had been there for some time and had been watching their tea party. The spoon was gripped in his hand. If he had been able to catch it by re if he had not been able to catch it by reflex, it might have hit him hard in the forehead and caused him to start oozing blood. Calm yourself. 
Our tea party is over now, Canon. How long were you there? If you'd called out to us, I'd have poured you some tea, too. I imagine that you didn't want to interrupt a pair of women talking, right? <laughs> Canon kept silent, but it seemed there was a slightly hostile look in his eyes. On the outside, he acted respectfully. But unlike Shannon, Canon did not trust the witch. Beatrice wrapped the table with her pipe, and the tea set turned into gold butterflies, which flew upwards in unison. They scattered in every direction, and the cleanup was already done. It was fun, Shannon. Let us meet again if the chance arises. My magical power is still quite lacking. It's tiring even to show myself. If it tires you that much, never appear again. Canon had said it in a small voice, but it seemed the witch had heard it perfectly. She giggled out, but did not reply. Shannon, tell me more about George at our next tea party. There are no snacks sweeter than a person's love life. <laughs> I bid you farewell. Beatrice's body also became gold butterflies, which scattered in all directions and disappeared. It was a very fantastical and beautiful scene, like a blizzard of gold leaf. For a while, Shannon quietly watched the witch's exit. Canon approached her from behind and spoke with a very different expression on his face than his sister's. Mesa, didn't I tell you that sh you shouldn't hang around with her? Beatrice Sama isn't that bad of a person. Yes, she might be a little strange, but... The fact that you, we can, only we can see her is suspicious enough. She isn't human. Who knows what she's planning? Kenon kun I think that's a little rude. Shannon spoke seriously, which was unusual for her. To Kenon, who knew her well, it must have seemed extremely serious. Kenon showed almost excessive surprise at Shannon's style of speech and remained silent. It's true that Beatrice Sama is different from humans. She has terrifying power, so I think she is to be feared and respected. But I think it's really rude to loathe her for just the single reason that she's different from a human. I know what you're trying to say, Nason. You've changed since she gave you that brooch. It's like, you th it's like you're the witch's prisoner. She mediated your relationship with George Sama, and now you're indebted to her. Don't say things like that. She isn't human. We don't know what she's thinking. You mustn't trust her. And we aren't humans either. Nason. Cannon's words became more serious. Those words probably gouged at Shannon's heart. Shannon bit her lower lip and hung her head. We are furniture. Even if we receive names and are treated as humans, that won't change how we were born. You're no longer furniture. Those words Beatrice had given her, which made her the happiest of all, floated through Shannon's mind. I am not furniture. No, you are. We're less than human. Nason, you're acting like you've forgotten that, and you're just pretending to be human. You should understand that yourself. I'm not furniture. I'm human. No, you aren't human. From the beginning, we have all been unqualified to love or be loved. It seemed that Canon's criticisms had shifted focus to Shannon's interactions with the witch. Shannon also noticed that quickly. I heard from the lady. Seriously, what were you thinking? I can't believe that you would go on a trip with George Summer. You've forgotten your place as furniture. You've just been tempted by that witch. <sighs> Mistakenly believe that you became human. Listen, Kanonkun. We certainly are furniture. Lesser beings. Inferior to humans. But if we were to gain the missing remainder, wouldn't that mean we'd have become human? That couldn't happen. No, it could. If we can gain that, we won't be furniture. We can become human. Ridiculous. As if we could. Cannon spat that out, but weakly, and turned away. That was probably resignation. The baptism of days upon days of suffering being furniture had firmly sealed his heart. You can too, Cannon Kun. You can become a normal human. Stop it. That's the witch talking. That's right. Beatrice Sama taught me. By gaining the single element of the world, we can become human. No, nobody's human without that. That's why people spend their entire lives trying to gain that single element. I have no idea what you're talking about, Nesan. I don't want to listen to rambling. Then I'll teach you in a way that you can understand. Look, see what I'm pointing at? Hmm? Shannon pointed straight at the sea 
at the horizon. Canon didn't understand why she what she was actually pointing at, and couldn't do anything except look between the horizon and Shannon's expression, which looked like it was posing a riddle. The ocean. canon -kun. What color does the ocean look like to you? It was an all-too-simple question. Canon tried to guess the meaning behind that question for a while, but since he couldn't think of anything, he gave his answer straightforwardly. It's an uninspiring dark gray. So what? Objectively speaking, the sea laid out beneath a cloudy sky could probably be described best by Canon's words. But as Shannon closed her eyes and smiled, she shook her head slightly. It looks deep blue to me. Is that what you mean? Like using the word blue for, for a green traffic light? Owl. Also, 20 gifted memberships from Ambien, though. Holy crap, thank you so much. I guess we should uh, look at this little translation note real quick while the while the ahahas are going off. Uh, grimoire. Okay, yeah. The color of al in Japanese has a range of meanings, including pale, fresh, young, naive, and the colors blue and green. In one word, the sea and sky are al. Fresh grass is al, and so is the green on a traffic light. Nowadays, Japanese has a native word, midori, for the color green, but the use of the broad word al is still very common, and this is the color Shannon uses to refer to the sea. Canon wonders if she is using al to mean something other than blue. Uh, if anybody in the chat is uh, a fan of modern anime, by the way, that's also the reason why uh, the main character from My Hero Academia has the name Midori, because the, the midori, color green, yeah. Yep. There you go. <clears throat> Gosh, that is, that is so many memberships. <laughs> Just uh, gonna give it a minute. Oh wow, yeah, it's got a lot to get through. <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe I should just uh maybe I should just keep going. Hold on, let me uh let me get plush Beatrice out of the way a little bit. Let me move her over here. <clears throat> Anywho. Let's keep going. No, the ocean is deep blue. If I can see that and you can't, then that's exactly the reason. Canon bit his lower lip and was silent for a while. I can't see it. Canon can stick out your hand. As Canon stood bewildered, unable to understand what she was saying, she took his arm and opened the palm of his hand. Shannon set so softly set something there. It was that magic brooch which she had received from Beatrice. The magic charm shaped like a gold butterfly which could fulfill love. This is her. No, this is mine. So think of it as me and treat it with respect, okay? This is actually, in, in my book, I would say this is probably one of the most important scenes in the entire episode. Um, if not the series, really. Um... The whole idea of being able to see something, depending on how you look at it, uh, to understand and be filled with love and see a gray ski, uh, see as a deep blue. Um, yeah, just uh, just ruminate on that one. After being told that, he couldn't just throw it away. Canon didn't know what he should do, and he stood there confused for a while the brooch still on the palm of his hand. Shannon put the palm of her hand on top of Canon's, and the brooch was warmed by both of their hands. This charm holds true magical power. 
I'm sure that it will teach you an important emotion, Canon Kun. There is no there is nothing her magic can teach me. No, there is. So wear it. If that's embarrassing, I hear it's okay if you just hide it in your pocket. Ridiculous. As if I'd be led astray by her magic. Even as he said that, Canon couldn't be cold hearted towards something Shannon was pressing on him. In the end, Canon agreed reluctantly to take it, saying he'd prove that he wouldn't surrender to the witch's power. Shannon smiled and nodded back. I'm sure that you can learn something important from it. And I'm sure you can become human. And when you do, I'm sure that this ocean will look a beautiful blue to you as well. Gray is gray no matter how many times you look. That's wrong, Kanonkun. It only looks like that because you have no... Huh? Because of the howling wind, he hadn't been able to catch the critical part of what she'd just said. So Shannon said it once more the single element of the world. She spoke once more of a world full of that element, where the sea was deep blue. I'm sure you'll be able to see a deep blue ocean. After all, without love, it cannot be seen. I just really want to let that one soak in. This is the first time that these words have been said in the novel so far, and you are going to be hearing them a whole lot more. Who's there? It's Canon, my lord. It was rare for Kinzo to leave his study. However, that in itself didn't mean his noble research had been suspended. He may have left the study for a change of mood. Yo, Iconic Laser with the five gifted memberships, let's go, thank you. Pour one out for, uh, without love it cannot be seen. Why is everyone freaking out? You will learn in time. By the time we have finished this series, in however long it takes, a, a very long time from now, when you hear the phrase, without love it cannot be seen, well, let's just say it never fails to bring some tears to my eyes. <laughs> he may have left the study for a change of mood, but the thoughts filling his head were no different from those he had inside the study. So Kanon knew that no matter what the time, speaking to Kinzo when he didn't want to be spoken to would always be a disturbance to his research. The weather is heavy. Will it get worse? Yes. According to the weather report, it could rain at any time. Shall I bring you an umbrella, my lord? That won't be necessary. You should leave me alone for a while. If my children ask, say that you do not know where I am. I am busy. On a journey through my own thoughts. Certainly. Then, if you would excuse me. During the time that Kanon bowed to him, Kinzo had already returned to his own world, and had forgotten that Kanon was there. And once again, he began rambling to himself. Amidst those words, the name of that witch was repeated many times. Oh, Beatrice, my hand does not reach your smile. What should I do to revive you? What should I do so that your smi you smile at me once again? What is lacking? My research? My materials? A catalyst? Or is it magical power? Or luck of an oracle? Oh, Beatrice! What must I do to see your face one more time? <laughs> As Kenon listened to his master's weeping voice over his shoulder, he turned around just once. When he did, right behind his isolated old master was the silhouette of a person that shouldn't have been there. It was the witch. At once, Kanon thinking that the witch must be plotting to do Kinzo some harm, quickly ran back to Kinzo, trying to become a shield himself. But when he saw the expression on the witch's face, that emotion of his vanished. Because Beatrice's expression was one of sorrow, or maybe pity. You fool, Kinzo. I'm right here. Can you not see me? Right behind Kinzo, as he repeated the witch's name over and over, Desiring to be re reunited with her more than anything else was the witch herself, and yet Kinzo couldn't notice a thing. Even when Beatrice tried to rest her hand on his shoulder, he didn't notice a thing. Why? Why does my hand not reach Beatrice's smile? Is it the phase of the moon? The period of the comets? The alignment of the planets? What is lacking? 
What? What? It's useless, Kinzo. Without love, it cannot be seen. Kenon took the brooch, he had brooch that he had received from Shannon out of his pocket. Could he learn that something, something that would enable him to, to see what he currently could not? Without love, it cannot be seen. He looked at Kinzo's back once more. The witch was no longer there. He 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 he. I'm I'm so living for these reactions right now. Anyway, are you ready for a fun, happy school festival? Are you ready to spend so much time with the better cousin, who is Jessica? <laughs> No more George for a while. <laughs> Let's spend time with Jessica instead. The biggest event for the Ashiramiya family in fall was the family conference in October. But for Jessica, there was another one before that, the school cultural festival. Jessica liked school. To her, it was a place where she could let out the stress she had built up during the rigid lifestyle she was forced to lead at home. This is unfortunately the one where they had to take out the song. It's not like, it wouldn't, I don't think it would get picked up for copyright um, on the stream, but unfortunately it is in the original release of the VN on PC. It uh, is a song that is taken from Toho and Jessica is cosplaying a Toho character, <laughs> even though Toho does not technically exist at this point in history. Um, but uh, but obviously they, they couldn't put that in the console port. So, whoops. Uh, would I play it just cause? Yeah, I can play it just cause. Um, let me have, let, let me get it queued up. Mm, da, 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 da. Here it is. Okay, so I'm gonna keep that loaded on a different tab. And yeah, the, the, Jessica is so Marisa Kirisame, it hurts. The, that is intentional. Uh, okay, so let me remember, what what is the mute key? Is it, let me wait until the music starts playing again. Uh, config. Does it have... Okay. Is it the sound? Hmm. I can't remember what key it is. I'm so sorry, hold on just a second. Uh... It is M. It's the M key, which I hit, so I don't know why it's not working. Yep. Hmm. I don't know. It's, uh, it's not working. <clears throat> well, uh, when we get to that part, I'll just have to manually go into the menu and mute it myself then. Uh, Jessica liked school. To her, it was a place she could let out the stress she'd built up during the rigid lifestyle she was forced to leave at, lead at home. For the cultural festival today, she had formed a group with her friends, and would be performing casual pop rock on a temporary stage. She had kept on preparing and practicing for that, and was really looking forward to today. But there was one thing that had been worrying her. She looked at the clock. There was still a little time, but she was uneasy. Would he really come? And she was about, as she was about to breathe out a stress-relieving sigh, her heart jumped as all her friends suddenly started speaking in shrill voices. No way! Hina's boyfriend's a total stud! He totally is, right? He totally is, right? Rin, your boyfriend looks hella smart! So the guy's a hard S with glasses? Like, for real? No way, my, no way, my man's a gyaruo! <laughs> It's not necessarily the case that all girls are like this, but at Jessica's school at least, the cultural festival was really a boyfriend exhibition. Jessica didn't have a boyfriend. 
She had many friends of the opposite sex, but no special one. But Jessica was a little famous around the school, and everyone naturally expected that she had a fitting partner. Furthermore, her pride had caused her to act like that was the case. Th through such acting and dodging of questions, she had somehow managed to keep up the bluff until this year. But for various reasons, she hadn't been able to escape this year's cultural festival. Jessie, is your boyfriend here? Huh? Uh, uh, no. Looks like he's not here yet. Maybe he's busy with work? Well, to be fair, uh, the whole red satellite, they didn't generalize an entire gender for once. Uh, that narration was George. This is just the general narrator. <laughs> what kind of guy is your boyfriend, Jesse? At least give us a hint. What type is he? What type is he? Awesome, he's a working man, right? Is he gonna come in a suit? Of course he's gonna be sporting glasses, right? Kya! Hey, but you don't really have one, do you? If you come clean now, I'll let you join me. Let's both flood this cultural festival, cultural festival with tears. No, no, no. I do, I do, I do. I'm telling you, I really do. <laughs> Jessica laughed awkwardly, covered with cold sweat. It was extremely doubtful whether she had really deceived her sharp-witted friends. My boyfriend's from Canada and he goes to a different school, yeah. Yes. Then how about making a fake boyfriend and taking him with you? F -f fake Who? I can't think of anyone. Shannon's ridiculous plan surprised Jessica wildly. Even so, it was a little more realistic than the unrealistic method running through her head of getting a boyfriend in a huge hurry before the day of the cultural festival. For example, what about Kanonkun? Kanonkun? No, no way, no way! And anyway, I'm sure Kanonkun will have work on the day of the festival. I don't want to bother him and stuff. Of course, I've already checked the schedule. Kanonkun has that day off. Oh, why are you always so clever at times like this? No, wait! It'd be even worse if he's off! I can't pull him away from his precious break just for my own vanity. If Kanonkun isn't pulled away, he'll always be shut away by himself. Are glasses an attractive quality, or is that a translation thing? Uh, it's just, like, generally uh, thought of as, like a, like, a serious guy, or like a smart, serious guy kind of thing. Uh, so they're just kind of like, wow, you know, like a, a dreamy, serious guy with glasses, you know, kind of thing. <clears throat> so I think forcibly dragging him around a bit would be perfect. It, you think so? No, but I'd feel bad for Kanonkun. Then I think you're out of options. How about meekly confessing to everyone that you don't have a boyfriend? Oh, sure, sure, that may well cause you to experience some shame, but you would only have to endure for the short and yet oh so long time before graduation. To those couples in love, there's no sweeter honey than the face of a single person with an inferiority complex. Shannon! You aren't really worrying for my sake, are you? You're teasing me! Jessica wrestled about with Shannon, her eyes teary. But Shannon was unconcerned, laughing with her usual smile. Yes. This is to get back at you for making fun of me and George Summer all the time. At the comeback of Shannon's, the likes of which didn't happen even once a year, Jessica rolled around on her bed, hugging her cushion, writhing and suffering. Shannon's triumphant smile was unbearably frustrating, but right now she was the only person Jessica could talk with. Cthulhu the Canadian $2, Jess and Shannon are besties in a historical way. Yes, well, some historians would say that. She could wait until later to suffocate her with a cushion. Why not, milady? It's a cultural festival, but it's also a chance for you to have fun with Kanonkun. Well, yeah, but... Uh, no, 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 no! Jessica buried her head in her favorite cushion to hide the fact that her face had grown bright red, and she bit away at her thumbnail. It really was a reaction to be appreciated. Shannon and Jessica were about the same age of the same sex, and they were also friends, and they were both right in the middle of puberty. They could never talk about things related to love. That's why they were both able to be open with each other about these topics. A wild Hannah appeared saying, oh dang, Canon does have T-boy swag, you're right. Jessica also understands this topic a little more than you would think. We'll get to it in a bit. There is a scene that as a trans person drives me fucking crazy every time I get go through it. It's just, it's so 
You'll understand. You'll understand. And they were both right in the middle of puberty. They could never talk about things related to love. That's why they were able to be open with each other about these topics. So Jessica had heard in detail about how Shannon and George's love was progressing. Shannon had heard the details of what type Jessica liked and what kind of man she might be interested in. Judging by Jessica's reaction, it would probably be crude to talk about that in detail. But we won't get anywhere with Jessica just rolling around on the bed forever, so to be blunt, Jessica had been thinking about Canon ever since he had first appeared. There were almost no young men on Rokenjima. So maybe it was natural that Jessica, as a girl in puberty, had become interested in Canon. But if anyone said that, it would destroy the romance of a maiden's pure heart and love it, and lo of love at first sight. Shannon had been with Canon the whole time at the Welfare Institute, so she had known him long before they had started working. So Jessica had asked persistently about what kind of person he was, what his hobbies were, what his favorite foods were, what type of girl he liked. Even Shannon could clearly tell that Jessica was infatuated with Canon. Come on, isn't it a good chance to take Canon Kun on a date? But, 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 but Kanon Kun might also have someone he likes. Wouldn't he take it badly if I made him go out with me just to show off? People who aren't honest about their feelings, such as you, milady. What was that word again? I learned it from George Summer. That's right. They call them Sundora. <laughs> no, not quite right. Uh. Sundora is the word tundra converted into the Japanese sound system. Uh, it is used as a pun and reference to the term sundere, which is a well-known character personality trait in fictional Japanese works. Sundere is composed of two words, sun sun and dere dere, meaning respectively aloof or cranky and lovestruck. It is used to describe characters that demonstrate an aggressive or cold behavior, sun sun, but then become all lovey-dovey, dere dere, under some circumstances. Apparently they'll be quite popular a few decades from now, you know? Wow, George Nissan sure is incredible. So he's capable of foreseeing future trends now, is he? Awesome. No, wait, you're saying I'm living in the wrong time period. <laughs> I'm doomed. Ultimately, Jessica wasted several days before finally agreeing to the plan of having Canon pretend to be her boyfriend. <laughs> George predicted 4chan. He would have founded 4chan if he had enough time. <laughs> Yes, my lady. Did you call me? Jessica realized that she had called him at a bad time and immediately regretted it. Canon always had a sour look on, but even so, he had some good days and some bad days. Unfortunately, this reaction was the latter. N no, um, well... Hey, five dollars from probably not Luke. Woo, Umineko time. That's how I feel every day of my life. With the crying battler icon too, that's perfect. <laughs> All that confidence and effort she had amassed by practicing in front of a mirror all night was wiped out in about five seconds. Jessica turned bright red and hung her head. Watching her, Canon sighed. Jessica thought he was getting fed up with her, and her, her face went pale. I heard from Shannon. Is it about me accompanying you to the school cultural festival, my lady? Is every day Umineko day for me? Yes. Every minute of every day. Huh? Uh, ah! Nice, Shannon. I mean, yeah, yeah, that's right. But, um, uh, do you have any plans that day? I was strictly ordered by Shannon to work specifically for you on that day, milady. I've never been to high school, so I don't really understand. But I hear it's a place where girls feel very ashamed if they don't have a boy with them. And I was particularly ordered to see to it that the daughter of the Ashirimiya family is in no way inferior to the common people. Uh huh. <laughs> Shannon, I'll beat you to death later! Jessica kept yelling with a strange voice, a broken smile, and steam pouring from her head as if she were a boiler. As Cannon watched this, he sighed again. Cannon wasn't an idiot either. He fully understood what Jessica intended by inviting him. However, in truth, he found it nothing but bothersome to go along with the ga lady's game of love. But Shannon had spoken to him persistently about it. He was very indebted to her for many things. He couldn't refuse. And in his pocket was that brooch. Couldn't this strange turn of events also have been brought about by the magic power residing in that brooch? Ridiculous. But those words of Shannon's came to mind. 
What did Shannon see that I cannot? I don't understand Shannon's feelings. We're furniture. As if we could become something more than that. Jessica still rambling out in a strange voice, and Canon sighing deeply, were a truly odd combination. Being a hater should be way higher on Canon's resume. It's his best quality. That's true. I love how much of a little hater Canon is. <laughs> there are some lines later on in the series that Canon has that, like, literally never fail to make me bust out laughing. Well, I will, I will remind you of it when we get to it in a million years from now. <clears throat> Jesse, someone's here for you. Didn't you hear? Huh? Uh, sorry. Uh, who? As my friends all gathered together, they were looking this way with hard to describe expressions, whispering to each other in low voices that couldn't be called low. Even I felt kind of shameless. Did I just say sorry who? Like I don't know who's shown up? Ah, crap, 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 my mind is blank. Oh my god, that's Jesse's boyfriend? What did we get? <laughs> oh my god! God! This outfit, I'm so... Ugh! I... Sorry, I know I was just saying the thing about, like, genderisms a second ago, but this is such a, like, do not look at any inch of my body kind of outfit. You know what I mean? You know? Like, ugh. God. He's so cute! She really had a boyfriend? No fake? Serious? For real? Jessica, you traitor! He's so fine! He's younger? I never heard he was younger. Where? Where? Where, where, where? Jesse's boy- Jesse's boyfriend? She really- uh, Okay, I wouldn't phrase it like that. He's not that much younger than her, guys. Hey! You took a while. <laughs> I didn't know where the entrance was. I apologize for being late. Right. Um, that outfit suits you, doesn't it? <laughs> Shannon said my normal clothes wouldn't do, so we went and bought this yesterday. It probably doesn't fit me. <laughs> That's not true. When, Shannon, when I get back, you're getting a posthumous two-rank promotion. This place is kind of filled with girls. It's uncomfortable. Yeah, isn't it? Come on, let's not hang around here. Let's go to the stage, all right? Because it'll be our turn really soon. Come on, come on, come on. It seemed that Jessica was just as uncomfortable. It looked like she was finding it difficult to cope while bathed in everyone's interested gaze. When he saw Jessica's appearance, Canon thought that he might have made things difficult for her by coming. Oh, sorry, I missed that, uh, notification. Menlo Marcial's supreme by any means necessary <laughs> with the two dollars. <laughs> oh, God. I get the feeling that I'm getting in the way. Am I a burden? N no, not at all. Seriously. If I am in the way, please tell me anytime. They're specifying that he's using the uh, pronoun boku there, which is a very, like, a, a youthly boy kind of uh, pronoun to use. Yeah! Oh my god, he calls himself boku! Uh, uh, you weren't a burden, Kanon kun Yeah, she calls her boyfriend kun! <laughs> what should I do, my lady? Oh my god, she calls him her milady like a butler! Oh my god! <laughs> no, don't call me a milady today! Uh, really? Understood, Jessica Sama. Yeah, she's trained her to trained him to call her Sama! Sorry, Kenon Kun. Just for three seconds. Could you close your eyes? Yeah, kiss, kiss, it's gonna it's a kiss, she's gonna kiss him! Okay, here goes. Bang, thunk, bam, bam, slam, crash. Should we talk about the Wadawa Beatrice uses, or has that not been brought up yet? Yeah, I brought it up a little bit earlier. <clears throat> when Canon opened his eyes, for some reason, there was a horrible tragedy in the room. Everyone had been driven into walls, their arms and legs outstretched. Jessica put her brass knuckles in her pocket before Canon opened his eyes. 
Anyway, let's go over to the stage. Our turn's coming up soon, so wait in a seat for a bit. Because we have to get ready. If you go straight to the end there, there'll be a temporary stage so you know where to go. Just wait there. Kanon seemed to be having a hard time adjusting. Pushing him in the back, Jessica sent him out into the corridor. Even though Kanon was confused by Jessica's attitude and show of agitation, which he had never seen before, he followed her instructions and headed in the direction she had indicated. After seeing him off with an awkward smile, Jessica slammed the door shut and yelled loudly, There you go! You saw, right? You saw! Happy now? <laughs> Sucks for you! Ugh, I lost the bet. I was so sure that Jessie didn't have a boyfriend. That wasn't a boyfriend, right? She's just harassing one of her servants, right? Uh, Jessie's boyfriend is incredible! Just shut up! Let's get ready! Move it! Move it! Jessica took the brass knuckles out of her pocket again and everyone energetically returned to their tasks. I was so sure Jessica was gay. She can be bi. <sighs> Kenon went down the corridor as Jessica had told him to and found a temporary stage setup where the vending machines should have been. It was probably being shared in time slots between the individual groups and clubs. A student group was singing and the place was already fired up. Disliking that ruckus, he found a dark wall to lean against alone. I'm confused, did Jessica beat up everybody in the room? Yeah. <laughs> She, uh, she comical slapsticked them into a wall. <laughs> so, this is what they call high school. It sure is noisy. Canon thought. Then he started- then he remembered Jessica just now, acting in a way that he'd never seen before. Honestly, she was in such high spirits that alcohol might have been involved. To him, the greatest virtue for a person was to always be composed and intellectual. Oh, thank you for the 99 cents from Neon Roses with the rainbow emoji. <laughs> Yeah, we all wish, we all wish that there was a little bit more of that going on right now, but anyway. In that sense, it was very hard for him to get used to the atmosphere in a school cultural festival. He had the responsibility of reporting everything he saw or heard to the master, so he would also have to report about Jessica's unrestrained behavior earlier. At the very least, it was not fitting for a daughter of the Ushirimiya main family. The master, Kraus-sama, and especially Natsuhi-sama, who would, would probably be angry. If I were to report it in a way that protects Milady, should I blame it on inappropriate school friends? What was all that? So stupid. Kenon thought back on how Jessica had acted earlier and sighed again. He could understand Natsuhi's headaches a little now. Come to think of it, Natsuhi-sama, as the president of the PTA, should have gone straight to a social after attending the ceremony in the gymnasium. Hadn't she said that it would she wouldn't be there to see Milady's event? That was probably for the best. The crowds are unpleasant. What in the world do they want? Several female students kept glancing at me. Oh, uh, at me. Canon narration. <clears throat> it seemed they were all whispering the same sorts of things that Milady's school friends had said, and it was really unpleasant. Come to think of it, didn't Shannon warn me? That if I was going to walk around a school festival on my own, I'd better watch out because a lot of strange people would come and talk to me. H Hello. Are you by yourself? Just as expected, a group of girls I'd never met started talking to me. Their stares started to make my back tingle. Didn't she tell me some magic words that could chase them off in times like this? Um, sorry. I'm with someone. Oh, uh, really? I I'm sorry. Ah, uh, it worked. Instant reaction. Well, that's got them to go away, but it hasn't really changed the number of people staring at me. No. No, it's that kid, Jesse's boyfriend. No way? That kid? I can't believe it. I was sure he was fake. He's so cute. Is he younger than her? I'm so jealous. <sighs> no way. I'm ever coming to a place like this again. Can't on side for about the hundredth time that day. Oh, okay. Okay. We're getting to it. I'm about to mute, mute the music temporarily, so that I can play the real music that Umineko Project cut out. All right, let's, uh, let's go ahead and, well, I'll wait a second to build up. As he did, the lighting changed and the standing audience started cheering. Looking around, I realized that there were suddenly a large number of people here, 
and unlike earlier, they were all guys. With this huge crowd, I couldn't even see the stage. Fortunately, there was a fallen beer case nearby, so I tried using that as a footstool, <laughs> and I noticed that <laughs> short canon moments, and I noticed that there was now a new group on the stage. The leader was Milady. Yep, her. This is the outfit that they had to give her in the port to replace the Marisa cosplay. Hold on, let me see if I can find a picture of the Marisa cosplay real quick. Where is it? Where is it? Yes, there it is. Let me uh, save this image because you need to see what Jessica looked like in this original part. Okay, hold up, hold up. Here. This is a. Uh, this is what Jessica looked like originally in this scene. It's so cute. It's so much better than this outfit. <laughs> but anyway, let's uh, get to it. The leader was Milady. She had changed into stage clothes and was even holding a guitar. I didn't know she could play. Well, let me turn that down just slightly. No, maybe she could. I've seen her practicing air guitar before. Natsuhi-sama wouldn't approve of any hobbies outside of study. Maybe she was practicing in secret. Come to think of it, she's been returning really late from school recently, hasn't she? Maybe she's been practicing at school, far away from Natsuhi-sama's prying eyes. It really is for the best that Natsuhi-sama didn't come. If Milady were to get scolded by Natsuhi-sama after putting so many hours of practice in, she would probably be very dejected. Jesse-sama! Everyone, thanks for gathering here today! I could hear Jessica-sama's forceful voice through the speakers. Jessie-sama? Maybe that's her nickname at school. The, student in the, the students in the audience kept calling out that name. I was a little aggravated by that inferior name, which was inappropriate for Milady. Jessica-sama was in great spirits as they kept calling her Jessie-sama. They were all probably her fans. With her mic performance, she was responding to that and firing the place up. It was almost like a song program on TV. At first, I had thought all of this was frivolous, but that feeling now changed into appreciation. This was pretty incredible in its own way. Is the song really Surupetan? Yes, Surupetan comes from uh, Umineko. <laughs> um, although, I mean, like, it is a it is a Toho song, but Surupetan specifically is in Umineko. Kenon had never listened to music of his own free will, but he had often heard the kind of music that the people of the Ushirimiya family liked. Since that was almost all classical music, Kenon had naturally started liking classical music too. So to Kenon, the songs Jessica and the others were singing were, how should you say it? Very modern. Hold on, I'm gonna, I'm gonna play it one more time. It was a Toho fan song, but originally Umineko had it as the song she was performing, yes. I know it's OG is Toho, I just mean that, like, the tune is from Toho, but... Yeah. But everyone looked like they were having a really good time. The diehard fans, who had even brought pen lights, sang along, dancing crazily with the exact same movements, almost as though it had been planned ahead. On the stage, Jessica-sama also sang enthusiastically, dripping with sweat. He couldn't find a single element that was appropriate for a daughter of the Ushirimiya family, but it looked like she was having a lot of fun. I think Silver Forest did other tracks for Umineko too, that's why the song was able to be used, yeah. I believe that's the case, yeah. Jesse sama Jesse, Jesse! Thank you. Okay, next up we've got a brand new one for you. Don't call me an ordinary magician! Okay. So now we will bring back the actual music. I hope you enjoyed having the Toho music for a bit. I couldn't keep up with the atmosphere, but anyway, Milady was so full of life and looked like she was having a great time. Turn the sound back up. As I looked at Milady having a great time, I thought, 
Isn't this what Ashira Mia Jessica is really like? Don't I know better than anyone just how badly life on Rokenjima kills your own sense of self? Then the time she spends, not as Milady, the successor to the Ashira Mia family, but as a single girl, girl called Jessica, living life to the fullest, must be very important to her. I worked close to Milady, saw her in all seasons, and I thought I knew everything about her. But that was only one single limited side of her, Milady of Rokenjima. We're furniture. We serve on Rokenjima, and end our lives on Rokenjima. So, I had come to think that Rokenjima itself was our whole world. As though, just like in the old geocentric theories, the ocean spilled off the end of the world into an abyss. But as I looked at Milady like this, I realized this was a horribly, nar horribly narrow outlook. I still couldn't keep up with the excitement of the crowd, but I felt like I had seen something that cannot be seen on Rokenjima. Although I don't know if, it, if this was the unseeable thing Shannon was talking about, I still can't see the ocean as blue. God. God. Wasn't today the cultural festival at Jessica's school? Or has the principal been doing well? Yes, he seemed to be in good health. Oh, that's right. Mr. Takamiya was also there. She was particularly insi- Oh, Miss Takamiya. She was particularly insistent that I give you her regards. Hmm. Busy as usual? It appeared so. She's a very energetic person. Oh, yes. There was also President Inomoto. Naturally, the topic of Jessica's cultural festival came up at dinner. School events often became social gatherings for influential people. It was the same for the Ushiramiya family, who were big names around this area. As Natsuhi remembered the names of the important people at the social, she updated Krauss on the news concerning them. Jessica didn't really have any interest in that discussion and rudely slurped her pumpkin soup. Milady, I would hesitate to call those appropriate manners. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. Jessica, I'm always telling you to do something about your speech. Yes. Jessica answered, discouraged. When he saw that, Krauss smiled a little and interrupted his conversation with Natsuhi. How was the festival for you, Jessica? Huh? Uh, well, okay. I was watching. You did a good job. Huh? Huh? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I guess. Jessica's face turned bright red. She probably hadn't thought that Natsuhi would actually come to see her on the stage. She felt a mix of happiness and embarrassment. Actually, she hadn't wanted her mother to watch because she didn't want to be told that her music was inappropriate for the Ushiramiya family. But it wasn't as though it didn't make her happy to hear her parents say that she did a good job after watching her try her best. You appeared with bo both composure and dignity. Fitting behavior for the student's representative. Oh. Oh. Yeah. The smile that had been there a second ago crumbled like sand. Jessica immediately realized that she was talking about something different. Jessica was also the school's student president. She had no interest in something so annoying, but her parents had been pushy, so she had grudgi grudgi grudgingly accepted. Unfortunately, she was popular in school, so she had won the election easily. So Natsuhi was praising her for the ceremony organized by the student council at the beginning of the cultural festival. Actually, she had just carried that out half-heartedly. She had immediately met up with her friends and had held a stage rehearsal for the rest of the time. The experience of standing above people and bearing responsibility will definitely be useful in the future. It will help you mature as a member of the Ushiramiya family. But you spoke the greeting a little quickly. You passed on content, but your fast style of speech dilutes it. It would be good if you developed a habit of t taking a breath every once in a while. Yeah. After she finished eating, Jessica didn't feel like going straight to her room. You could say that her room was the place where her parents had specified for her to be. So maybe you could say that, for Jessica, choosing not to return to her own room and instead disappearing to an unknown location in this large mansion was a meager form of resistance. 
No, yeah, uh, Kamikaze God, that breaks my heart. It, me too. I like, I felt that deep in my soul when I read that for the first time. Like the, the whole feeling of like wanting your parent to acknowledge something specific and then like not getting that. It's just, it's very, it's very sad. Jessica felt that even being in the mansion made it hard to breathe, so she went outside to the rose garden. Well, even if she had come, she'd just have said something about how it wasn't appropriate for the successor to the Ushiramiya family anyway. So what the hell's my problem? <laughs> Jessica laughed at what she was sulking over, laughed at what kind of words she would have had to receive to be satisfied. Ridiculous. I'm just a spoiled little kid. I can't believe myself. It's almost funny. Hey, thank you, Judy. Love your content, Marcy. I appreciate it so much. Thank you. Milady. What? Kenonkun, don't scare me like that. Kenon had suddenly started talking to her just as she had tried to force a laugh, so she choked. What? Something to say? Yeah? Jessica's expression had become the one Kenon always saw. The listless Jessica from a second ago was gone. If he, only still, if he still only knew Jessica as the successor to the Ashiramiya family as he did until today, he would have mistakenly thought that Jessica's mood had sprung back to normal. But that was wrong. He now knew a part of her that he could not see until today, so he understood that there was no way that on the inside, Jessica was just as she had appeared. Uh, about today's cultural festival. Well, thanks for coming with me so I could show off. You really helped. You're singing. It was good. What? Um... <laughs> really? I'm embarrassed. Even though she had heard the words she had most wanted to hear, Jessica became shy and couldn't accept them frankly. I cannot sing, and I don't know how to play any instruments other than the harmonica and the recorder, which I learned in elementary school. So I just assumed that you were the same, my lady. Kenon hadn't been consciously looking down on Jessica to that degree, but people playing unique instruments were always on the other side of the bronze tubes in the TV. He had gotten it into his head that it would be impossible for Jessica, at least. I'm furniture so I didn't believe there was any need to sing or play instruments. But I'm not sure anymore. Kenonkun, seriously, enough with that phrase, I'm furniture. That's some kind of servant's mentality, right? That servants should be living furniture thing? Genji says it a lot. It isn't a mentality. We really are furniture. I know the kids from the Gospel House receive assistance from Grandfather in various ways, and I realize you feel gratitude for that. But that doesn't mean you should call yourself furniture. Aren't you a human like us? Kenonkun, when you saw me singing, what did you think? It looked like you were having a lot of fun. That's probably not it. Huh? It wasn't that I looked like I was having fun. You were jealous, weren't you? Even Kanon himself probably hadn't noticed that emotion. Kanon had seen something that he had never seen before, never known of before, and had probably become jealous. And to trick himself about that emotion, he had called himself furniture over and over. I know I'm the successor to the Ashiramiya family or something, and, well, I'm sure there'll be a lot of annoying stuff to do in the future, too. As far as that goes, I've just got to resign myself to it. I was born under an unlucky star. Probably just like you had to live at the Gospel House. Neither of us have had a choice. We couldn't choose the stars we were born under. That may be true. But there's one part where you and me are completely different. You know what that is? I'm furniture, and you're not. He was about to say that, but stopped. I don't know. Kenonkun, you think that your own fate's everything about you, and you gave up. I can't accept this kind of fate. So I decided to do the best I can. So, as well as my normal constrained self, who has to act as the- Oh god, here we go. You know how I said earlier that there was a line that drove me insane as a trans person? This is it right here. So as well as my normal constrained self, who has to act as the daughter of the Ashiramiya family, 
I've created another self who pours all of her heart into the things she likes. Another self. Yeah, Kenonkun, you've been telling yourself I'm furniture. I'm sure there's been many tough things that you've forced you yourself, that have forced you to tell yourself that. I think that's really unfortunate. But for that to determine your entire life, it feels so sad to me. You know, people can always make another self inside themselves that they can really grow to like. This isn't escaping from reality, okay? When I'm that other part of myself, I can really feel like I'm living a great life. So no matter how constrained and boring everyday life is, I can definitely live without suffocating. To make another self that you can really grow to like inside yourself. To make another me, which isn't furniture. Through her relationship with George Sama, has Shannon given birth to a part of herself that isn't furniture? As did this other Shannon, see something that cannot be seen by furniture? Yeah. Well, I don't know anything about your private life, Kanonkun, but I can sort of guess. Your private life is probably nothing at all. Bullseye? Kanon couldn't reply, but that answer was enough. He had no concept of a private life, so Kanon would always be Kanon, so furniture would always be furniture. Kanonkun, that Kanon isn't your real name, right? The Gospel House gave new students new families and a new life, so it also made a point of giving each of them a new name. In, this ca in his case, that was Canon. Certainly. That name of my mine may be a temporary, temporary thing. He had thought that he wasn't anyone other than Canon, but he remembered. There definitely had been a part of himself that wasn't Canon, but that was far, far away, beyond the distant fog of oblivion. So even for you, it should be all right to have times where you're Kanonkun and times where you aren't. Maybe the Kanonkun you are when you act as a servant calls, calls himself furniture and strictly limits his own will. But when you aren't Kanonkun, I think it's all right to live much, much more freely. Those words definitely weren't just lip service. Jessica had always had also been like this in the past. She had cursed her own birth and into an, into an environment different from all of her friends at school. She had been the only one in a heavily constricted environment, forced to learn various things. And she had even received words about the friends she played with. Though she had been sad about that, she had given up, thinking that she had just been born under that kind of star. But one day, Jessica had stopped giving up and surrendering. Stuff like the Ushiramiya family customs and pressure. Those didn't matter. She created a real Jessica inside herself, who could do what she really wanted to do. You know, I'm called by this nickname, Jesse, in school. So when I'm Jesse, I can live life honestly and to the fullest. And because of that, I can do my best when I'm Jessica, too. Maybe you could too could have times when you're canon, and times when you're, um, your real name, and live a different way in each. When you aren't canon. <laughs> Fuck, God, sorry, it's getting to me a little bit. Can you try being another self who you can go to like? When I'm not Canon. He had thought that his real name didn't matter at all. So she had thought Canon was all he so he had thought that Canon was all he was. And now Jessica was saying that he should create a new existence, another self that wasn't Canon. Canon kun, if you don't mind, tell me, what's your real name? He was silent for quite some time. Maybe his real name had risen to the tip of his tongue. After hesitating for a long time over whether he should say it, in the end, he swallowed it back down. I forgot. My name doesn't matter anymore. Those words signified a slight rejection. No matter what kind of real name I had, the only truth now is that here, I'm canon. The past has nothing to do with anything. Just as it does not matter the name of the tree whose trunk a piece of furniture was originally made. I said stop that. You aren't furniture. You're human, you know? I'm not human! Kenon clearly spoke his refusal. It was with a rage he normally didn't show. Jessica couldn't say anything back and was struck silent. 
You are human, milady. So you're free to live any way you like. And any kind of future is possible for you. It's almost like you have wings. You can dance through the sky like a bird. I'm not like that. Even if you see me as a bird, I'm nothing more than a domestic duck. They may have wings, but they cannot fly. To speak of that dream of flight despite that, that's just too cruel. Furniture, ducks, what the hell is all this? No. Jessica had unconsciously gone along with Cannon's forceful manner of speaking, but she realized she shouldn't fire back and swallowed her words. I don't know anything about you. I don't even know your upbringing. And I don't know the hardships that you've been through. So I can't even imagine why you started calling yourself furniture. But know this. You aren't furniture or a duck. You're a real human. If you want to say that the canon can working as a servant is furniture, that's all right. But in that case, don't you think you could make another self for when you aren't furniture? When you are a human? Only a human like you can embrace that possibility. I'm not like that. I have no future, no possibilities, and no dreams that I am permitted to see. So, my lady, please don't say any more cruel things. Why? Why are you saying that? Because it seems that you're mistaking me for a human just like you, my lady. We're different beings. I just wanted to make that clear. I heard from Shannon. Something about you taking a liking to me. Huh? Huh? Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> I look almost identical to a human. Therefore, like Shannon, maybe I could delude myself that I am a human. And for time, pretend to love. But that would surely be fooling myself. No, it would also be fooling you, my lady. Shannon and George Sama will definitely fall apart. Shannon herself must understand that that day will come. And yet she does this stupid. There, there's nothing stupid about it. Sure, George Nizan's a brilliant person, and he's bearing both of his parents' expectations. And yeah, when it comes to marriage, I'm sure Auntie Ava's going to interfere in a bunch of ways, and, um, I think they've got a really tough road ahead of them, all right? But you know, George Nissan isn't the kind of guy who'll surrender to all of that. He won't turn Shannon into Juliet. He'll definitely make her happy. People in furniture cannot love each other. I'm trying to say that even if you can love furniture, I cannot love you, my lady. <laughs> Those words of Canon's crushed all of Jessica's bittersweet feelings from today. There was no way she could have anticipated the emotions of such a blunt rejection. In an instant, she lost the willpower that had caused her to try and unravel something stubborn in Canon's heart. And before she knew it, she was just standing there in shock. The lady, if your feelings are for me are due to my conceit, then I beg for your forgiveness. No. Well, um, I won't deny it. Thank you very much. Huh? For thinking of me as a human. Thank you very much. Just those feelings truly make me happy. And anything more would be too cruel, so... No, that... that's enough. Um... sorry. Jessica scratched at her head as she spoke and tried to force her voice to sound bright. I just kinda... went on ahead by myself and caused you trouble. I'm... honestly sorry. I'm really sorry for using your whole day off. No. I was also happy that I could see you having fun. Then, let's be done for tonight. If I don't go back to my room and turn off the lights, Mom will get mad at me again. <laughs> that would probably be most appropriate. I wish you a good night, my lady. Yeah, good night. Jessica turned her back to him and slowly trotted away, looking disheartened. But suddenly, she started dashing pell-mell and disappeared in the direction of the mansion. As he watched her go, for just an instant, Canon was tormented by the feeling that he had just made a huge mistake. But no, he thought, 
This had not been a mistake at all. It was for her sake that he'd been forced to refuse her now, while her pain was still at its smallest. Nice going, making a woman cry like that. <laughs> I didn't expect you to refuse her that strongly. Had you answered normally, another pair of lovers would have been born with my magic. How long have you been there? You're just horrible. When he turned around, the witch was suddenly there. It looked like she had been there the whole time, enjoying their performance as if it were a play. I shall forgive your reckless words towards me just this once in deference to that pleasant show. Even after 1,000 years, no more interesting show exists than complications between men and women. To me, it's an addictive pleasure sweeter than any other. Hmm? Canon pulled the butterfly bro brooch out of his pocket. It was the crystallization of the great magic that the witch had bestowed. Without hesitation, Canon flung it hard onto the ground and stomped on it. Oh. What is the meaning of this, when you know that that was something given to you by me? Just now, I figured it out. What you're doing isn't as tasteful as being a cupid of love. You're just a demon who enjoys showing love to those who could never be joined, and deceiving them. <laughs> you're afraid to think that. Most humans I've lent my power to have said the same thing. Don't play dumb! You didn't lend Shannon your power because you felt sorry for her. You took advantage of a weak point in Shannon's heart as it burned with love, and made her break the mirror that sealed you. And that's not all. You're toying with her, when you know very well how it's going to end. Am I wrong? <laughs> Furniture is a thoroughly pitiful existence. So you have no dreams, no future, and even no love. Good, good. There's nothing better than knowing your place. <laughs> Just as you suspected, there was a faint love growing in Jessica's heart. You're under the impression that you've snipped it out, harvested it. But did you know? Trees grow thicker branches if you thin them out instead of letting them grow rampant. A girl who loves furniture. Interesting. Truly interesting. Shannon and George will also eventually reach a stalemate with their unfulfillable love, and will bear just the kind of large fruit I like. However... To my regret, they've been getting on so well that it just isn't interesting, you see. In that respect, I think you two shall entertain me greatly. <laughs> the witch laughed. Even though she had known the two could not be joined, she had lent magic to join them together. However, they couldn't escape the fate that made it impossible for them to be joined. The witch knew that. Even if they were joined, the relationships of Shannon and George, Canon and Jessica would fail for certain. And as they wandered through the eternal desert in the hell of love, they would be tormented by eternal thirst. Did you think I would lend them that power without any compensation? I'll lend a hand in love, and my compensation shall be one ticket to watch the cruel fate that the two of them will eventually meet. Even after 1,000 years, no better show exists. Just look at Kenzo. See how he ended up, an old pitiful man who knew the taste of love and was thrown out of paradise. Look at how he lives, like a dead man who can't fully die. <laughs> you really are a witch. Get out of my sight, you demon! I shall disappear regardless. My power still hasn't returned, you see. It's still tiring to continue showing myself. I overdid it when I gave you lovers my power. As I am now, it will not be easy to maintain that power without the brooch as a catalyst. Canon ground his foot even more into the stomped bro brooch. He felt it break under his foot. Then, it dissolved as if into water and changed into butterflies that sparkled gold, which fluttered away from beneath Canon's foot. I also find it a little difficult to continue preserving this form. As you ask, I will hide myself for a brief period. Just as there's no tide that does not rise and no moon that does not wax, my magical power will surely become whole again. And there will certainly come a, there will surely come a time that is appropriate for my revival. I cannot imagine whether that will be tomorrow, next year, or even 100 or 1,000 years in the future. But as long as there are those that entertain me, I will surely gain power and revive. I will disappear for a short while. Until that time comes, the bruise on the palm of your hand is already gone. So if you wish, tomorrow morning you can let my existence disappear like an illusion or a, dr a dream. There's nothing more saddening for me than to be forgotten. However, I will definitely be revived. 
Make sure that you won't regret that day's coming at any time. I will surely have my second coming, and control everything as this island's true master. And at that time, the door to the Golden Land will be opened again. The covetous and greedy shall call me forth without fail. Enough! Disappear now, Golden Witch! Leaving behind a mocking laugh, the witch turned into a flight of gold butterflies and scattered away. The whole area sparkled like a gold blizzard in a snow globe. It was a fleeting, fantastical scene that disappeared in a heartbeat. The witch could no longer be seen. However, Kenon felt like he could still hear that shrill, unpleasant laugh. Ah, how entertaining. How entertaining. Why is the human world so entertaining after such a long absence? Go insane with love. Go insane with gold. Those who don't go insane from those are not human. I see. Then the world of furniture is fitting indeed. <laughs> furniture is created to serve humans. And I toy with, the, toy with and tyrannize those humans to ease my thousand years of boredom. What a truly entertaining rock-paper-scissors situation that I cannot control furniture. Kinzo, your enterprises are truly interesting. Furniture, try and see if you can hunt me. Tonight, two seeds of love have been sown, including the one already sown that makes three. Beatrice, why? Why did you leave me alone in this painful world? I detest you. You are yearned after this much and yet make no attempt to answer. I will detest you for all eternity. My lord, drinking any more will be damaging to your health. Haven't you also been warned by Dr. Namjo? Be silent, Genji! You do not understand. You do not understand my grief and sadness. Even though I believe that as my oldest friend, at least you would understand my pain! Why is it so incomprehensible to you? <laughs> Beatrice! Why did you leave me alone? <laughs> what the hell is all that furniture stuff? What is all that crap? <laughs> oh, how heartrending Jessica Sama, even though her crying voice that I can hear from her room tells me of the situation, there's nothing I can do. This is all a tragedy due to people who are too young getting too close, and the positions of their birth are too distant. I can do nothing but understand the lady's feelings, and walk away quietly with silent feet. Kumasawa back at it again with the Greek chorus. True. Um, what? what do you mean by that, George-san? I mean what I said. I still haven't built up my castle. Once I have, I'll be able to think of myself as an adult for the first time. When that happens, I want to marry you. Th that's... Um, uh... But... My heart won't let me just do that anymore. So I want to give you an engagement ring. E engagement you say. But um I'm f furniture. That's right. And furniture has to listen to what people say. Oh, I'm going to kill him. I'm going to oh, I'm going to kill this guy. <laughs> I'm currently having a ring made that's worthy to be a gift for you. I think I'll probably be able to bring it to the next family conference coming up soon. I'll give it to you then, so please, I want you to let me hear your answer. If you accept my engagement proposal, I'll proclaim right there to all of the relatives, including Grandfather, my engagement to you. G george son. I'm sure some people won't approve of our relationship, but there's no need to look at their faces, because you only have to fill your eyes with me. I'll definitely make you happy. That, I promise you, definitely.
So, um, by the way, uh, I feel like this is a good time to mention, um, if you haven't ever listened to it before and you are, uh, you know, going through Umin Echo for the first time because of these streams, I would highly recommend the podcast, the episode by episode podcast, uh, Go uh, Golden Truths is the name of it. Uh, each episode corresponds to uh, a particular arc of the, like a full arc of the series, except for like two of them, or like a couple of them have uh, two episodes. So like episode one has two episodes. But uh, but I would definitely li listen to that podcast as you finish these episodes. Look it up, Golden Truths. It's really good. Uh, the analysis is really on point. It brings a lot of dimensionality and discussion to the characters. Please check it out, but do be aware that obviously if you check out episodes that cover arcs that we haven't read yet, you, it's full of spoilers, so yeah. But anyway, um, the reason I wanted to bring that up though is because they uh, brought up something in this part that I thought was kind of interesting. Uh, obviously George and Shannon's relationship sucks, but like a big like a big thing for me for a long time was like, why, like what does Shannon even see in George personally, you know, like Aside from him just being like a generic nice guy, like what, what is that? Like what's the draw? Um, I thought it was really interesting. They said basically like for Shannon, she has like a really sort of like, un like she has an uncertainty surrounding who she is as a person. Uh, she obviously doesn't even view herself as human in a way. So she's really depersonalized and like sort of, you know, conflicted with that sort of thing. So here comes George, who is like, I mean, he sucks, but he's like a very generic, like, man's man, kind of like, oh, baby, I'm gonna scoop you up and I'm gonna, you know, give you like three children and we're gonna sit on my porch and drink tea and all that stuff. Um, and so like, so to somebody like Shannon, there is a certain appeal in like somebody to basically just coming in and telling like, you don't have to think about who you are. I can tell you who she is, or I can tell you who you are. Uh, you can have a place in this big, wide, fucked up world. I'll tell you what that place is so you don't have to worry about it. Um, I just, yeah, I thought that was an interesting way of looking at their relationship. Um, and I do see some truth to it, certainly. <clears throat> Um, Cthulhu, uh, I have an analysis to dump here, so can I? It's about the scene with Jess and Canon. Uh, as long as it doesn't have any spoilers for the future series, then yeah, feel free. I encourage discussion. <clears throat> anyway, time to get back to this dramatic music. <laughs> I look forward to seeing how it will ripen. The gold butterflies do not swoop upon the juice of overripe and rotting fruit. I cannot wait for the day of harvest to come. It's the, is it the time of the banquet here yet? <laughs> so like Cinderella from Into the Woods. Mm hmm, definitely. The first day, October 4th, 1986. Oh yeah, baby, we're back to the island. It's time for the family conference. Um, which also means that I have to give you another warning because we have just got done with all of this uncomfortable stuff with uh, George and Shannon. Uh, now we're going to see some stuff that we didn't see before. Remember back in the first arc when the uh, family had gathered at the airport and um, Rosa and Maria show up a little bit late and Rosa's like, oh, sorry, we missed our train. Uh, we had we had like some trouble making the connection or whatever. Yeah, we're gonna see what Rosa and Maria were up to uh, during that time off screen. So again, I have to give a really big content warning for people who are sensitive to this kind of stuff, this scene is going to feature some pretty on the nose verbal and physical child abuse. So, sorry for that. <clears throat> they had eaten breakfast at a coffee shop in the station building. By chance, the inside of the shop had been decorated with Halloween colors since it was October. It seemed that Maria had really taken a liking to that. 
Ever since she had been making a fuss inside the train about wanting to have a Halloween festival without caring that she was attracting the attention of- Oh, ever since she had been making a fuss inside the train about wanting to have a Halloween festival without caring that she was attracting the attention of others. Halloween is popular in Europe and America, but people are hardly familiar with it at all in Japan. The shopping district was colorfully decorated with orange pumpkins. But the costume parades of children demanding sweets and saying trick or treat were nowhere in sight. Oh, I want a Halloween festival. I don't want to wear these clothes. I want to look like a witch. Oh. The family conference isn't for playing. We're going to meet grandfather, so you have to dress up nice. While it wasn't completely full inside the train, there were enough people here that almost all of the seats were occupied. Among them, Maria was making a fuss, kicking her feet back and forth in her seat while Rosa scowled at her. Halloween's gotten more popular in Japan since the 80s. Uh, I, I think so, but I wouldn't be able to tell you with authority. <clears throat> Rosa had told her many times in a low voice to stop, but Maria was taking no notice whatsoever. Once Maria gets this way, no matter how much you try to explain the situation or calm her, she doesn't listen. In the past, Rosa used to pamper Maria and give in to her at times like this, but that had probably been the problem. Almost certainly, the young Maria had formed the wrong impression that if she kept complaining noisily, her mother would give in and listen to her. That error had been brought to Rosa's attention through an educational book, and since then, she had hardened her heart so as not to pamper her beloved daughter. But Rosa could manage less and less mutual understanding with Maria, and it had become more and more common that she felt discouraged by her own powerlessness. Halloween! Halloween! Trick or treat! I'm not giving you any sweets. You just ate breakfast. Trick or treat! Trick or treat! As Maria kicked her feet, a stout old woman sitting in the seat across from Maria picked a candy out of her handbag to give it to her. Ooh, got a treat, got a treat. Look, look, Mama. Mama, happy Halloween. Maria, you can't just accept sweets from strangers, remember? Return it. It's all right. <laughs> She's a lovely young lady. How old is she? There may not have been any malice in those words from the old woman, but it seemed that Rosa had taken that in an extremely humiliating way. Maria, I'm always telling you not to accept sweets from strangers. Okay, yeah, a special interest show with Jupiter August. Uh, you said that you just got here, so you didn't hear my warning. This scene is a Rosa Maria scene. If you saw any of the previous streams, uh, yeah, child abuse warning. Please take care of yourself. <clears throat> This one's mine! Oh, oh, no, it's mine! Let, let go of it! Don't I always tell you to listen to what Mama says? It's mine! Mine! Oh, oh, oh. I told you, stop making that childish whining noise! Oh, oh, oh. Rosa reflexively hit Maria violently on her cheek. In a flash, Maria started crying loudly. Rosa immediately snatched the candy from Maria's hand and stuck it out towards the dumbfounded old woman sitting next to them. Please, do not just give sweets to my daughter. I I'm very sorry. Breathing heavily, Rosa once again held the candy out to the old woman. The woman looked confused for a moment about what she should say but then understood that perhaps her actions may have caused trouble for this parent and child, and she accepted the candy back, apologizing. The, the old lady in that moment literally like, what the fuck is wrong with this woman? Then Rosa finally took notice of her surroundings. Her daughter's clothes were all messed up. She was crying and shouting with her nose dripping and there were many dumbfounded passengers watching them. Except for the sound of the train running, the rail car was completely silent. Fortunately, that pitiful silence didn't last more than a short while. However, in its place came an even more painful atmosphere as everyone whispered. Maria shouted, cried, kicked, and stomped her feet as usual, paying no heed to the people sitting around her. Impulsively, Rosa tried to slap her again, but she noticed the cold eyes of the people in the train and couldn't do any more. 
When the train stopped, Rosa got off, forcibly pulling Maria by the arm and almost dragging her along the ground. No, God, this really speaks to Rosa's character. Like, she sees the way that people stare at her with, like, condemnation for hitting her kid. And instead of being like, oh, maybe I should stop hitting my kid, she drags her out into a private place where she can continue hitting her. As usual, Maria didn't stop crying. Rosa took her to the end of the platform and hit her cheek again. At the moment she was hit, Maria stopped crying for an instant, but before long she shouted and cried even more than before. Rosa, whose emotions had exploded, grabbed Maria by her collar and pulled her hair as if to rip it out. Oh, oh, oh. Mama, it hurts! It hurts, Mama! Oh. Can't you hear me? I'm telling you to shut up! That ooh of yours! I'm telling you to stop it! There's, that's the reason you can't make friends in class, don't you get it? Get a hold of yourself! Why are you always a kindergartner inside your head? Why can't you do what Mama says? Why? Why? Oh boy, oh boy. Yeah, it's bad. Oh, ugh. God, it's awful. Along with those severe words, Rosa hit Maria's head over and over again. The more Maria cried and shouted, the more Rosa hit her. And the more Maria was hit, the more intensely she cried and shouted. Mama, it hurts! Mama, it hurts! Mama, save me! Mama, save me! <laughs> Why can't you just stop that whining? It's because you're like this that you can't make friends! It's because you're like this that Papa never comes back from his business trip! It's because you're like this that I... Excuse me, madam, is something the matter? Is there something that you want? The one who timidly called to her was the station attendant. Rosa glared at him with a look that said, don't cut into the problems of a mother and child, stranger. The station attendant surely hadn't wanted to talk to her. However, Rosa had been yelling on the platform for a much longer time than she had imagined. Her emotional scolding had caused the passengers on the platform to advise the station attendant that it would be a good idea to speak to her. Rosa yelled at the station attendant that they would get on the next train and not to bother them anymore. And then, finally, or maybe we should say for the second time, she noticed the passengers on the platform staring at her from a distance. Rosa sweated slightly. She felt the wind chill the sweat, tormenting her. Maria was still crying, shielding her own head. No, unless this beating stopped, she would probably keep crying forever. As Rosa recovered from the evil heat inside her head, she knew she had surrendered her soul to something bad again. Mama, 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 come back. <laughs> Rosa fell to her knees and hugged Maria, whose face was all soggy with tears and mucus. Maria, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Mama. Mama, welcome back. Welcome back. Finally, Maria realized that her mother had turned back to being her mother. Then she clung to her mother's body and cried, burying her face in her mother's chest. Forgive your bad mama. Forgive your bad mama. I'm so sorry. Please don't hate your mama. Oh, I'm perfectly fine. Who won't hate mama. Mama was just being possessed by an evil witch again. But Mama came back, so it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mama was being possessed by an evil witch again. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. For a long time, the two of them hugged each other, asking for forgiveness and sending words of forgiveness back. After a while, the two of them gradually calmed down and naturally drew their faces apart. Um, from reading a little bit of people's theories about Rosa, I really, really emotionally dislike the idea of Rosa having DID. It's not DID. Um, let me just put that clear and out on the table. This is, that is not the implication that is supposed to be drawn for this. Um, when they talk about this other 
uh, self or like this other attitude inside of Rosa. It's she literally just has like an anger disorder. Um, she is in, an incredibly unmedicated, untherapied woman who has problems uh, with anger, and also just like she's just generally an abusive person. Um, that being said, uh, she does intentionally go along with Maria's invented uh, justification specifically to absolve herself from feeling bad. Okay. Yeah, and as me, I get it. I just mean, you know, people did the thing with DID in response to split self-dialogue in their theories. I Okay, I understand. I just, I just wanted to make clear that, like, people, like, not follow that line of thinking, um, because I, w I wouldn't want that to be, like, thought of as what's going on here. <clears throat> Uh, Cthulhu, uh, they said the dad hasn't come back from his business trip. Does that have something to do with this? Yes, you could say that there's something in there like that, yes. But, uh, we, uh, we won't be addressing that for a little while. <clears throat> Anywho. <clears throat> Maria's face, Rosa's face, both were deep red after crying their eyes out. Do you want to have a Halloween festival, Maria? Yeah, I wanted to show the pumpkin marshmallow to George Onichan and Jessica Onichan. That was the suite which had been alongside the cash register at the shop where they had eaten breakfast. It was a fancy suite that had a big orange marshmallow in the shape of a jack-o'-lantern stuck in the end of the stick. Maria had wanted that and had insistently pestered for it. Rosa had disallowed it, saying there was no way she would buy such a suite right after they'd had breakfast. Okay, then. Maria, I don't know if they sell those in this town or not, but let's go off and try searching for one, okay? Mm, yeah. Love you, Mama. Love you so much. Thank you. I love you too, Maria. The truth was that they had no time to waste loitering around at a stopover station. If they missed the airplane, they would fall half a day behind schedule. She should have left home with more time to spare, but she had ended up leaving late after spending too long choosing Maria's clothes. Because of that, M Rosa had been a bit impatient since the morning. She looked at the clock. They should be getting on the next train immediately. But her daughter had firmly joined hands with her to go buy the suite together, and that hand was warm. To Rosa right now, it was more important to regrow her bonds with Maria. Maria was not only Rosa's beloved daughter, she was everything Rosa had. Fortunately, she could see that there was a big supermarket right in front of the station. Maybe she wouldn't be able to find a suite exactly like that one, but Maria would probably accept something similar. Besides, Rosa also couldn't show up with a face swelled from crying. She would have to fix her makeup. We might not find a marshmallow exactly like that one, but I hope we can find a suite that's similar. And let's surprise all of your cousins with it. Yeah. If it's a suite I bought together with Mama, anything is fine. The two of them left the turnstiles of the station in the unknown town. Maria walked along the pedestrian crossing together with her mother, feeling very pleased, as though she was walking in an amusement park. Both faces were still deep red, but warmth could be seen on the two of them, mother and child, as they smiled at each other awkwardly. She could definitely afford the therapy she needs, but yeah, pride thing. Definitely that, and also just like, Japan's mental health, uh, system back then like uh wasn't particularly great like even now it's still it, like it's getting way better but uh at the time especially it was very stigmatized um people with mental health struggles especially things like that like you would just more often than not be like almost completely ostracized yeah take care of yourself atropos um, definitely. This is, like, this is a lot to go through. It's hard. So, like, if, uh, if people can't, like, handle these types of scenes, then, like, please, by all means, take care of yourself. <clears throat> Dear, what are you doing in a place like this? Oh, it's you. <laughs> that's, a, that's a nice way to speak to your wife, Kraus. It's nothing. It's just this, that this was a pleasant place to think. I've finished all the preparations for today. For now, shall we relax and wait while drinking some tea? Sorry. 
I'm always pushing all of my problems onto you. Please, can't you rely on me more? I am your wife. Naturally, I'm grateful for you always coming to my aid. For that very reason, I'm able to devote myself to my work. I understand that. About your work. And the topic of father's inheritance, right? That has nothing to do with you. It's nothing more than my greedy siblings scavenging for rotten meat. It's all right, dear. Everything will work out. Your work has never turned out badly. Mm. Natsuhi softly cuddled close to Krauss's shoulder. She spoke words of re to reward Krauss for the difficulties of his work, but Natsuhi was herself the one who knew best that it wasn't going well. Krauss's enterprises were something like a seesaw where large amounts of money swung. A big investment leads to a large return, but the swaying of a large-scale seesaw is lar large yet sluggish, and not something which shows immediate results. At times, he would make it more investments so the seesaw inclined faster towards the good side. Naturally, he did that because he had the confidence that in the not-so-distant future, he would be able to recover all of the investments made. However, the seesaws Krauss chose never turned out as he would have liked them to. His foresight wasn't wrong, but times were slow. They never caught up with him. For example, think of a literal seesaw placed in a park. Due to its great popularity, there was always someone playing on it. So if he wanted to play, he would have to wait a long time for his turn. And then, one day, he found the seesaw vacant, straddled it, realizing he was the first to arrive and had it all to himself. However, nobody got on the opposite side of the seesaw, so he couldn't play on it. And no matter how much time had passed, nobody came to the opposite side of the seesaw. The seesaw is a popular piece of playground equipment, so if you waited, another person would definitely show up. Krauss noticed. The weather looked like it was getting worse. That's why nobody was coming outside to play. But the seesaw is a popular piece of playground equipment, so someone would definitely come. If he vacated his place because the weather seemed to be getting worse, someone would definitely snatch his place away, and he would only end up longingly gazing from a distance at someone else having fun playing on the seesaw again. On one side of the seesaw, he continued to wait patiently, all alone. That was Krauss's current enterprise and situation. If only I'd had a bit more courage and the self-confidence to believe in my own foresight, I'd never once have failed. Yes, that's true. Your foresight is never wrong. You're the only one who had inherited father's gift. You inherited an innate disposition that none of the other siblings did. Yet, I was unable to believe in it. I always closed my own projects like a coward. Why can't I trust myself? Who would trust a man who can't trust himself? Nobody. I'm always sitting myself down in the seats where the losers must sit. My mo father, my mother, and my siblings, all of them sneer at me. How long before I'm set free of this complex? How long? Only Natsuhi knew. She knew of Krauss's anguish. As the eldest son of the Ushirimiya family, who would have to shoulder a big responsibility, he couldn't open his pained heart to anyone, and would always be compared to his father's great enterprises. I have finished all of the preparations, so you can devote yourself to the family conference. All of them. Sorry. Will there be any problems? With father? No. Genji and Dr. Nanjo are, are on our side. I'll never allow those greedy, si greedy siblings to meet father. Goda! <laughs> Hello, Goda here. Yes, please leave it to me. I'm anxious to put my skills to work for the big annual job. Ingredients of varied colors had been gathered in the kitchen, and the preliminary arrangements had already been started. Even though it was still morning, the ingredients for dinner were already in saucepans and steaming. Normally, he had to deal with several assorted ma matters other than cooking, but on the day of the family conference, he could devote himself to it entirely. To Goda, who was originally a chef, this was surely the greatest gala, of a gala occasion of the whole year. Yes, dinner will be an excellent calf steak. A wonderful cut of meat is in the refrigerator anxiously waiting for tonight. Please, let the other servants know how to look forward to tonight. I will not disappoint them, either. 
it was rare for Gota to be in this good of a mood towards his fellow servants. To Gota, who boasted about being a chef who worked exclusively for the Ushiramiya family, being given the right to show off his cooking at the family conference was the greatest honor. Okay, I'm leaving it in your hands. Also, is Kumasawa there? Kumasawa-san? Oh, I happened to see her earlier, but she's not here. I wonder if she went to make preparations at the guest house. So she is looking around again. No, that's fine. All right then, I'm counting on you. Yes, leave everything to me. Genji placed the telephone back on the receiver, sighing lightly, thinking of Kumasawa, who was no doubt hiding and slacking off even though things were busy, and the ostent ostentatious Gota, who only felt like doing anything on a day where he could show off. Genji sighed once again. Excuse me. All the rooms in the guest house have been prepared. We received instructions from a lady to make preparations for four people so the children can stay there. What shall we do? I hear, I hear Battler Sama's coming this year for the first time in six years. I guess Milady wants to stay up late with the other three cousins. Get them ready. No need to tell Madam. I see. Certainly. So tonight, we'll have the late night shift followed immediately by the morning shift tomorrow. It looks like those two days, these two days will be tiresome. Speaking of that, the weather forecast is saying a typhoon will strike over here. Would I ever consider doing a video on Umineko? Uh, I've made a recommendation video for Umineko, um, briefly, kind of like a, a pitch for it. But uh, as far as like a long form, uh, like a retrospective type video, it would be kind of hard considering how extremely long Umineko is. I would, I like, I would like to make another Umineko related video in the future, but I would want to think of a different format for it. <clears throat> Will that be all right? Unless the typhoon diverts greatly, it may affect the family's boat trip back, depending on the circumstances. The family conference schedule may drag on until about Monday or Tuesday. It will probably be a long haul, but I ask you both to be careful not to make any blunders. Shannon, relax and don't panic. Canon, be sure to greet them with courtesy. Y yes I'll be careful. I'll be careful. Today we'll be entertaining a very important guest. Make extra sure that everything goes smoothly. I understand fully. Any guest who visits here is important. Canon, we welcome today an important guest in the truest sense. Make sure you're prepared. Yes. Shannon, what's wrong? You've been looking restless. Did you promise to be somewhere? Huh? No, it's nothing. My apologies. Nason, an important guest will be arriving today. Detach yourself from your private life. I don't... I don't know what you mean by my private life. <laughs> As Shannon blushed just a bit, she turned her gaze away from the clock. Was it about time for the airplane carrying the family to arrive at Nijima? She had thought that she had been hiding the fact that her long-awaited reunion with George was making her heart palpitate, but Canon, who stood at her side, understood her perfectly. Oh god, this. Shannon, please accept this from me without a word. Inside a bathroom stall, George was practicing something over and over, taking out a small velvet box hidden in his pocket like a quick-draw desert, desert gunman. But that's not it. The Shannon likes a man with traction. It, it must have a more powerful feel to it. Shannon, put this on your ring finger. That's an order, okay? Uh, if I don't say it properly on the left hand, maybe she'll put it on the right hand. Uh, no, Shannon isn't that ignorant. Uh, but if there's no free will, that'd be a little mean. I mean... Uh... As he crossed his arms, moaning and groaning, someone knocked on the door. <laughs> hey, you taking a big shit in there or what? I need time! Get out of there! George was startled back to reality. Hey, George Kuhn. You all right? Got a stomach ache or something? Uh, <laughs> uh, Uncle Rudolph, uh, it's all right. I'm fine. Uh, no, no, no need to worry. 
You sure? Okay then. Don't strain too much. Your ass will burst. Rudolph washed his hands laughing cheerfully and left. My man really was like, don't get constipated. Anyway, Rudolph out. <laughs> George knew that the most embarrassing part hadn't been overheard, and he patted his chest in relief. Kyrie, isn't Rosa here yet? Not yet. She's pretty late. It's a good thing the weather's delaying our flight. If the schedule had been like normal, she'd have missed the plane by now. What would she have done but what would she have done then? Rosa son's an adult now. She'd manage it somehow. No matter how old they get, older brothers always treat their younger sisters like children. Dad's always a kid, no matter how old he gets. What'd you say? If I'm a kid, that makes you a baby. Come on, Battler Chun, up you go! Uh, stop it! That tickles! <laughs> stop! You two look more like a couple of naughty kids than a father and son. Look, she's here. Oh ho! If it isn't Rosa son! Maria Chun, long time no see! Long time no see! Huh? Oh. Maria, shouldn't that be it's good to see you again? Greet your uncle properly. Hmm. It's good to see you again. There you go. Well said. How about some candy as a reward? Oh, huh? Uh, where'd I put them? Kamikaze. Hugs for all people in chat during George scenes. Thank you for the affection. We all need it. We all need the reassurance to be able to get through George. <clears throat> Where's the sun? It's good to see you again. It's good to see you too, Maria-chan. It's been too long, kyrie san hideyoshi san Oh, and oh my, battler -kun. Look at how big you've gotten. Ah, uh, come on. <laughs> it's embarrassing hearing that from every person I meet. Hey, Rosa, you're late. If the plane was on time, you'd have barely made it. I'm sorry, but we had some trouble making our train connection. So we're waiting on the weather yet again? This is literally the exact same dialogue from episode one in this scene, but look at how much your understanding of the characters and what they're saying to each other has changed based on the additional information that we've gotten earlier in this episode. I just think that's so crazy. Oh, don't complain. I much prefer the 30 minute plane trip to spending six hours bouncing around on a boat. Even if we're kept waiting here for an hour, it's still much faster overall. Is that Maria? She sure has gotten big. She's at that growing age. You last met her six years ago? Of course you change. Women are creatures that can be born anew in a single day, and all it takes is a change of heart. Hmm? Maria noticed a big man who she didn't remember being mixed among the relatives and hid behind Rosa's back, glaring at Battler. Hey, Battler, say hi. Last time you met her, she was just three years old, so this might as well be the first time. Yeah, I guess she wouldn't remember if she was three. Hey, Maria. Long time no see. You sure have gotten big. Maria, this is Battler Onicha, Uncle Rudolph's son. Understand? Uncle's son is... Uncle's the son. Hmm? Oh. She was obviously on her guard. She must have found it frightening for a large guy like Battler to suddenly start speaking frankly to her. Battler noticed that as well and thought of very, various ways he might approach her. Then he noticed the sweet she had in her hand. It was the jack-o'-lantern sweet that Rosa had bought for her. Oh, right! It's October, so that must be for Halloween! <laughs> Trick or treat! If you try to take a treat away from a small child, normally you'd expect them to cry and start a fuss. The adults thought that method wasn't good, but surprisingly, Maria looked pleased, her face splitting into a wide grin. Halloween! Halloween! See, Mama? Battler knows about Halloween, too. See? See? Hey, call him Battler Onichan. Sorry, Battlerkin. No, no. I don't care. Call me Battler. And I'll call you Maria, too. Come on, Maria. It's Halloween. Trick or treat! Trick or treat! <laughs> From inside her handbag, Maria picked out a jack-o'-lantern sweet identical to the one she had in her hand and presented it to Battler. It seemed that Battler accepting it was enough to confirm their friendship. The adults felt admiration at how children had their own ways of communicating. To Maria, who had been complaining that she wanted to have a Halloween festival, it must have felt like Battler was a friend, since he knew about Trick or Treat. Her defensive posture from before was completely gone. Now she was all merry, as though they had been friends for decades. 
The scene is starting to diverge from chapter one. Good eye, Daniel. Hold on just a second, I gotta reply to a text. <clears throat> yeah, Halloween's a minor event in Japan, isn't it? You often see people parading around in costume on the news over there, but I've never seen it in Japan. I wanted to wear a costume too. I wanted to do trick or treat with all the cousins wearing costumes. Yeah, bet you did. Let's us two do it together sometime. What would you want to go around as? A witch! And Beatrice! Oh, milady, what are you doing in such a place? Madam was looking for you. I'm here because I don't want to be found. But she only wants to nag at me anyway. All that crap like, is your appearance all right? Mind how you speak. <laughs> Without a doubt. You know, when the day of the family conference comes, for some reason, I start getting weird feelings about this witch. Oh? Why ever do you say that? The family conference is the day when everyone related to grandfather gathers. Like, I hear battlers coming for the first time in six years this year. Same kind of thing. I always wonder whether some relative who hasn't shown themselves for several decades might suddenly turn up. Oh, could a relative like that exist? I'm talking about Beatrice Soma. Nobody knows her background. Could she be grandfather's mistress from long ago? Maybe one of her descendants will suddenly show up and tell us to give back the gold we were granted or something, you know? <laughs> Krausama and the others will probably have a discussion about the problem of the Master's inheritance this year, too. With such excitement abound over talk of the Witcher's gold, I don't suppose it would be strange at all if the Witch herself who granted that gold finally made her appearance. Kumasawa-san, you know, sure you're always quitting one moment and working the next, but you've been, as here, been here as long as Genji-san, right? You know more about Beatrice, don't you? Well... I wonder. <laughs> even if I try to remember, this old woman here can't recall even recall what she had for breakfast this morning. Kumasawa-san, you're always escaping with those excuses, but you know something, right? Something I feel a kind of devious at- sometimes I feel a kind of devious atmosphere about you. Like you know something and you're laughing behind our backs. Oh, <laughs> how harsh. I don't have any secrets. The only thing I can say is that Beatrice-sama is the Golden Witch, and she's the other master who controls the Knight of this island. That's secondhand talk from Grandfather. Even though you get paid, it must be a pain to go along with Grandfather's tales. But I can say this much. What? In ancient times, Rukenjima was feared and called... Uh, uh, ugh, I always have trouble pronouncing this one. Azukijima. The story told among the fishermen is that the Azuki was a mispronounced form of Akujiki, and in fact was called Akuji, Akujikijima. Ak which, yeah, the first one is Azuki Bean Island, and the second one would be Evil Appetite Island. I've heard this before. It's that story of how, because all the sunken rocks and shipwrecks around here, the fishermen got afraid and stayed away as much as they could, right? Evil spirits had settled down in Akujiki. Akuji Kijima, devouring human souls from time immemorial. There were too many people who got involved with this island and were dispossessed of their lives. And it all settled down when a traveling mountain ascetic or someone built that shrine and laid those souls to rest, right? What a shady story. They say that shrine was destroyed by an eerie violet, violet thunderbolt this summer, which tore through the darkness of the night. We know that that wasn't the case, though, don't we? Well, at least we know that the mirror wasn't destroyed like that. We don't know about the rest. <clears throat> um, by the way, just to, to give you guys an idea, since I know we've been going for a long time, uh, we are going to be stopping pretty soon. I have a particular scene in mind of where I want to cliffhang off, and it is not really that far from here. 
So, just giving you guys a heads up. Kumasawa-san, you really like those stories, don't you? Sure, it'd be pretty creepy if a thunderbolt wiped out the shrine keeping the dead at peace. But, well, it was all worn out from the start. I bet it just got carried away by some large wave. <laughs> the evil spirits of Akushikijima woke from their sleep and summoned Beatrice-sama. <sighs> so, if Beatrice-sama ever happened to come for the family conference, then... Then... Kumasawa kept silent for a moment there. Jessica, who wanted to keep wanted to, her to keep going, found that silence very eerie. Once Kumasawa was satisfied that she had spooked Jessica just the right amount, she grinned broadly. This summer, when the mirror was destroyed, the shrine was still there. That's a way shorter time between Shannon and George getting together and now than I expected. Yeah, uh, we are narrowing down the timeline with uh, details. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. The mirror could have been any time before the shrine disappeared. That's true, but it still had to be up while the portrait was up too, uh, which means it was sometime in the last two years. Well now, I wonder what would happen. <laughs> Whoa, that sounds wonderful. It, do it does, doesn't it? Isn't it useful for your work to enrich your heart and have an elegant time every once in a while? I think so. The heart and the wallet must be rich. Got it. Now keep that day open. Please, make the reservations. Will do. No backing out. Yeah, let's make it happen. I love you, Kyrie. After kissing the receiver, Rudolph hung up. In front of his seat, there were many executives with their sleeves rolled up, eagerly awaiting the end of that phone call. Sorry about the wait. Have we had contact from America? Yes. It's from our lawyer, our lawyer Dale Watanabe, on the external line. I'll transfer it. Overall, how do you feel about the situation? Well, I'm afraid it seems it's not all that favorable. It seems they have no plans of withdrawing from the trial. Looks like we can't fool them after all. So yeah, this is uh, sometime before the uh, trip day. But uh, again, remember back whenever the siblings tried to corner Kraus in episode one, where they were like, ah, you know, Kraus, you're probably embezzling money. And he came back at them with all of these things like, hey, Rosa, you signed this bum deal. And, you know, uh, Hideyoshi, you got those like people stealing your stocks and stuff like that. Um, he had said to Rudolph, like, hey, you're getting sued like for something in America. Uh, like an American court is suing you or something like that. And uh, and Kyrie didn't know about it. So, yeah. Here you go. <clears throat> Looks like we can't fool them after all. <laughs> Please, transfer it here. Very well. Right away. The executive ordered the secretarial office to connect him to the external line. Immediately, the telephone in front of Rudolph started ringing. Hello. Hello, hello! Oh, so uh, to give you some context, uh, by the way, since this I don't have the voices on, if you're wondering what the little carrots around the hello, hello are, the little carrots are basically used for like, they're, all of these characters are speaking in Japanese, but when it's in carrots, they're trying to speak in like English. So it's like they're kind of, kind of strained English. That's what's in the, the carrots. <clears throat> Apologies for the wait. Shiromiya speaking. Good day, good day. How's it going over there? Hello, President Ushiromiya. Let's skip the greetings and get right down to business. I have good news and bad news. Which one shall we start with? Bad news can go first. Can't fight it if there's no dessert. Very well. The bad news is that they've started preparing to prosecute us. Just a few days ago, a verdict was handed down in a similar trial, overwhelmingly in favor of the plaintiff. The defendants were also making roughly the same arguments as us, but they were rejected in everything. I'm afraid to say it, but if we face the courtroom as we are now, the probability that our argument will be rejected in its entirety is extremely high. So, that other trial was a disaster. And I was thinking their conditions were more favorable than ours. That's tough. Then, what about the good news? I managed to get in contact with their executives. I explained our situation to them. Explain that we have no intention of tarnishing their brand image, and I managed to get their understanding. They'll offer us conditions in a few days, and if they're carried out, they promise to withdraw from the prosecution. This comes straight from the number two man on their board of directors. Your impression? 
Honestly, I expect the conditions will be extremely severe. I'd assume that changing the company name and brand name will be inevitable. Where we do have margin in the negotiations is the amount of settlement money, the appearance of a public apology in the newspaper, and the amount of time needed to carry out those things. Why don't they just come straight out with it and tell us to go bankrupt? They changed their, they changed their second president only a couple of years ago, and the new president doesn't have a firm foothold on the position yet. If we resist until the bitter end, they fear the forces who want to go against the current president wouldn't hesitate to do some work in favor of the enemy. Hence, it seems the big shots over there want to settle this matter as fast as possible, too. Therefore, for the sake of a quick settlement, we may have enough leeway to pull, pull for some mitigation of the conditions. At any rate, an absurd amount of money will be necessary, I guess. You need to be prepared for that. And even so, I believe it'll be much cheaper than a disciplinary compensation. Thank you very much. If there's any more progress, please contact me. <sighs> you bill highly, so I can't even chat around idly with you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Goodbye. Rudolph hung up the phone. It seemed that the executives sitting in the reception seats could guess what had been said. You get all that, you reprobates? Well, to sum up, we can just pay them off, they're gonna let it slide. All we have to do now is turn our focus onto how much. The president. The sum that Mr. Watanabe estimated for the settlement's too much. We don't have that kind of margin. If we'd known this was gonna happen, we should have, we should have started diversifying. The calculations were that we could escape the capital crisis if we were able to endure for three years. To be stabbed at this juncture is just incredibly unfortunate. Guess we tripped and fell at the step of the hop, step, jump. I could cry. We have no choice but to draw the money from the main bank. Banks are no good. They only bet their money on winning horses. The situation's getting better, but we can't show weakness to the banks. President, do you have any funds which are unaccounted for? Funds that we aren't aware of? Stop that. Do I look like that kind of man? The contents of my wallet are all exposed to you guys, all right? The account books over there show that all our company has. In that case, we need to raise money. We need a sponsor who can draw in several million dollars for us as soon as possible. President. Couldn't something be worked out with one of your associates? President. President. Ah, uh, calm down, you bastards. I'll find a way to raise the money. You guys just maintain the business and try not to fall to pieces. They're saying they'll forgive us so long as we hand over the money. We already have thick pipelines in Asia. This will probably have consequences all over the place, but we can still maintain our deals. The point is, this is a problem that can be entirely resolved just by handing over money. Just watch. I'll settle everything. I won't let you out in the cold. Start feeling like you're in good hands. When this is all over, I'll be rewarding you guys with the champagne tower. I promise. So just shut up and follow me. All right? The airplane suddenly shook, probably because of turbulence. That shaking roused Rudolph from his sleep. He had woken up early that morning and had ended up drifting off to sleep while resting in his seat. Are you all right? You're still very drowsy, aren't you? You've been so busy with work lately. It's a damn good thing I am busy with work. If I suddenly found myself with nothing to do, we'd all be out in the cold starting the next day. You're right. Bathurkin's come back now, so I'm afraid we can't just go around begging if things get rough. Yeah. We finally got our whole family back after six years. Man of the house is going to have to give his best so we can all spend some family time together. When he looked outside the window, he saw that the airplane was starting to drop in altitude considerably. The fishing boats, which had only looked like black grains until a short while ago, had clearly become visible. Oh, the Umineko DLC. <laughs> yeah, so for those of you who are wondering, uh, there is an extra episode. Uh, there are eight episodes in total, but there is a, like an extra ninth episode. Uh, which basically is just kind of like, it's a side story. It's not really important to the main story, um, and it's only like a few hours long, but uh, it does exist. So, you know, maybe once we get to the end of the main series, if people want it, I'll play it. <clears throat> uh, it is called, what was it called again? Last Note of the Golden Witch, yeah. If I could prostrate myself before Dad and borrow ten mil in exchange for a punch to the head, I'd take at least a dozen, but... Failing that, he'd better hurry up and give the ghost. I've mooched off him so much for the, over the years, 
Now I'm going to be for the in and now I'm going for the inheritance. I'm going to hell. Won't surprise me a bit if he doesn't want to see me. Could it be that you don't plan on appearing at the family conference this year either? Nanjo looked at Kinzo's face, sighing. So am I going to cover the whole VN? I would hope to. That's the hope. Kinzo's eyes remained rooted to those strange magic books. I have no intention of joining those vultures in their discussion. They can discuss how they'll suck my bones as they wish. They're not worth a moment of my time. Uh, is that part of the Umineko Project too? No. Uh, Umineko Project does not have any of the additional, like, uh, pamphlet-related content. Um, most of that stuff is on an extra game called Umineko Subasa, uh, and there's another one that has a different pack of short stories called Umineko Hane, I believe? And then the newest one is Umineko Saku. Uh, Saku has a console port, but as with all of the other console ports of this series, it is only available in Japanese. Uh, that said, there is a uh, English fan translation of it, so if I ever want to read any of the, the additional content um, to you guys, uh, I do have the console port, and I do have the English patch, and I do have a Switch that is capable of playing it, so uh, I can do that if it uh, gets to a relevant time. <clears throat> and yes, Hane is in feathers. My, my. How troublesome. Nanjo shook his head slightly. To him, children and grandchildren were to be adored, and he believed that their growth was the only enjoyment for old men. He found Kinzo's words to be a very sad thing. If the time comes when I must leave this room, I will show myself then, just as that, as that one does not show itself. I'm sorry if I read that weirdo. Didn't quite, I stumbled over it. What is Umineko Project? Uh, Umineko Project is the version of the game that I'm playing right now. It is basically the PS3 version of the game uh, as basically like recreated from scratch by fans so that they can play it in English on PC. Also, yes, there is a stage play. Um, two of the episodes have been done in stage play form. The third one is being performed like either right now or very soon. Oh, whoops. Sorry, I, uh, skipped the line. Wait, okay. What? Oh. Sorry. The log for the stuff that I already read later, I guess, already exists, so... Ugh. Inside Kinzo's head, there was no conception of today being the day of the family conference the day when all of his dear family would gather together. There was only the face of the witch in the oil painting who never smiled outside of her portrait. Everybody knew that when Kinzo talked about Beatrice, unnecessarily cutting in would instigate his wrath. Today, I will perform a certain ritual. What does the word Umineko mean? It means seagull. Uh, when the seagulls cry, that's what Umineko no Nakakoroni means. Oh, and what would that be? It would be more accurate to call it a gamble. After all, no miracles dwell in magic without risk. Nanjo had already heard this countless times. You could call it Kinzo's favorite phrase. It seemed that Kinzo believed in magic and miracles arising though betting his own, through betting his own fate with a certain kind of risk, probability, and beating the odds. Kinzo-san, you may once have been called the Golden Gambler. But I cannot imagine what kind of gamble you'll take on with that aged body when you could go to the other world at any time. I guess this will be worth seeing. Hmm. I see. So if it were up to you, unversed in magic, even this secret ritual I have thoroughly researched would be branded as a gamble. So be it. If it is, if it is I, a believer in miracles who wins, you will be able to understand clearly that all of my research, which probably only appears as a vagary in your eyes, did bear fruit on this day. If you win, it will all end as just as you observed, nothing more than the vagary of an old man who could go to the other world at any time. Oh? I wonder what on earth is this gamble you'll start? 
As your friend, I only pray that you come out from come out from that bet. No, was it a ritual? I only pray from the bottom of my heart that you can come out from that ritual victorious. Mm-hmm. I thank you. Speaking of that, Kinzo-san, I hear that a long-awaited guest will be present at the family conference this year. What? Kinzo reacted in an unusual way to Nanjo's words and turned around. You know, Battlerkun from Rudolfsson's family. I hear he'll be coming for the first time in six years. I'm sure he'll be a, he's become a splendid boy. Oh, Battler. I wouldn't describe a guest who's been away a scant six years as long-awaited. Upon hearing Battler's name, he showed an ill-humored expression, as though he had been let down and turned his back to Nanjo again. I guess these six years went by in the blink of an eye to you, sunk in your research in this room. Hmm. Perhaps a truly long-awaited guest will pay us a visit. Everything depends on the results of this roulette. This roulette is already starting to revolve. Ru- Ro- is it Ru- is it Rouge or Noir? I think it- yeah, from the spelling, or I don't know. Yeah, I, th I think in this context, in context, it's Rouge. Rouge or Noir? Tonight, let us enjoy ourselves as we see kind what kind of miracle the roulette will show us all. The payoffs are large, and I don't feel like losing. Beatrice, you shall accept my bet. <laughs> Damn, seeing you go from your his voice to yours is wild. You're very good. Thank you. Just then, the telephone on the table rang. The piercing noise seemed to displease Kinzo, and he picked up the receiver in order to preserve the silence as much as he could. <laughs> Can you imagine, like, a telemarketer calls you and you just, like, pick it up and instantly put it down? What is it? I'm busy. It's Genji. Her family has arrived. And what do you- what does that have to do with me? You can serve them some tea or something. Certainly. I'll see to it. Kinzo hung up the phone rudely. Watching him, Nanjo sighed yet again and shifted his attention outside the window. As he was now, Kinzo would probably show no interest in any kind of guest. Was there any guest who could make Kinzo agree to come out when he should? He had one person in mind, but that guest was one who could not possibly appear. After a glance at the Witch of the Portrait and her candid expression, which he could not place as happy or sad, Kinzo Nanjo gazed up at the leaden sky. Uh, to be fair, uh, the special interest show, uh, it's partly that, but it's also because it is the Italian pronunciation. Yeah. Oh, here we go. Hey, everybody. You know how I said that there was a specific uh, part that I wanted to get to, to be your cliffhanger? We're at it. Now then, are all the pieces lined up? Let's start a new game with the pieces all lined up once more. Are there any problems? Nope. The witch looked at him in challenge while elegantly smoking her pipe. And Battler. He just slovenly shrugged his shoulders as though she wasn't worth his time. He wouldn't look her in the eyes. But that didn't mean he wasn't going to play. It signified his plain determination to never be taken in by the artifices of this being he faced. It was an expression of his powerful determination to fight. Don't tell me. You don't have a plan? I don't know how you're going to play, so no, I don't have any plan. Feel free to take the first move. <laughs> Naturally. I intend to. In what way shall I destroy your defense? In how many moves will I checkmate you? That is how I will display my skill. Whatever moves you come at me with, I will never believe in you. As long as I stand my ground on that one point, I won't lose. And what that means is this. The way this game is made, you cannot win. <laughs> Maybe you're right. However, I shall decide how many times we'll repeat this game. It will be repeated over and over again, until I win and you admit defeat. In other words, this is torment. Eternal torment that will continue until you surrender to me. Continuing eternally, until you acknowledge me and the existence of witches. In that case, I'll go along with you endlessly, any number of times, until you run out of patience. I've never lost in such a battle of wills. Did some witch or other suggest that to you? 
<laughs> That's just fine. Cthulhu with the two Canadian dollars. I've heard this track in so many of your videos. Yep. I'm tired of listening to your rambling. Come on, let's get this started. Come, let us begin. I already know your moves far too well. A defense doesn't amount to much if the plan behind it is known. Don't think you'll be able to defy me with the same moves. Beatrice, I have only one thing to tell you before we start. What is it? You're free to say anything, but when it comes to whether I believe or not, that is always for me to decide. No matter how great your magic is, my soul won't yield to you. You think this will be torture for me? You're wrong. Then what would you call it? This is torture for you. Someday, you will yield to me and give up. Until then, you'll be tortured over and over again. <laughs> How amusing. A fine metaphor. Torture where we torment each other. How truly amusing. Come, we shall begin that torture. Shiro me a battler! Thank you, Iconic Laser, for the five gifted memberships. <laughs> and now, next time, we will start the game. Sorry, I had to get loud. It's the Iconic Ushiro Mia Battler. How could I not? <laughs> Anywho, are you all, uh... Are you all having a good time? <laughs> Are you all, all, all satisfied with the setup? Because now that we've done all our setup, ooh, things are gonna get crazy next time. Things are gonna get crazy next time. <laughs> but, for now, we have to save. And so, before I go, we're gonna do what we did at the, the end of the last stream for just a few minutes, not too long. I'm not gonna like stay around for uh, a super long time, but uh, I'm gonna go to the characters menu just for interesting backdrop. And right now, I am interested. Uh, everybody tell me, what, what, what do you think is going on? What's your uh, speculation about episode two so far? What are your theories? Is it magic, is it not? If it's not magic, how? What's going on with those scenes with Beatrice? I want to hear all your delicious thoughts. And as we're all speculating together, I think it is only appropriate that we bring up Kyrie MatPat <laughs> as Tron by Daniel the Spaniel. Thank you for drawing that funny prompt that I put out there. <laughs> we, we have to put on our theorist glasses, so she will be here. <laughs> I was confused by how the characters all died at first, but I see that this, how the story will function in the broadest sense. Mm -hmm. The magic doesn't exist. Obviously, Shannon's delusional in canon too. All right, but uh, if they're uh, if they're delusional, then um, then you know how how did all that stuff with George and uh, and Jessica happen? Huh? How do, how'd they uh, how'd they get the how'd they get the power to to solidify their love? Who knows? <clears throat> uh, Canon's episode one declaration that I won't get fooled again by you, Beatrice. Sure is interesting now that we know how he was fooled the first time. Isn't it? Isn't it? Can I do the analysis I talked about earlier? Yeah, absolutely. Feel free. Go ahead. Uh, I realized that in episode one tea party that George and Jessica both got their wish. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that the stuff with it being real or not may be way more in flux. Like, the past will be changed by present perception. Hmm, yeah, that, that, that's definitely an interesting way of looking at it. Um, there's a gas leak on the island. Yeah, everybody's just, uh, everybody's just on ketamine or something. <laughs> My theory is that Beatrice is a big cat and it's a race between her knocking the chess pieces off and Battler flipping over the chessboard. In a manner of speaking, you are correct. 
There's no power here that solidified it. George was already attracted, and if we assume there's no mistelling to the truth here, Shannon would have just needed the confidence to approach him. Possibly. And Canon has very little experience in life. Uh, similarly, Jessica is desperate for a guy. Yeah. Possibly, possibly. But I don't know. Sometimes, th there's a lot of uh, talk going around in this episode about what somebody can see, or what they choose to see, how they see it. Um, I would I would love for you all to continue keeping that in mind as you continue to craft your theories in the future. Everything is witches, the earth is witches, the sky is witches, time is witches, death is witches. I mean, yeah, yeah fair enough. It's all just one really bad acid trip. I guess that Beatrice versus Battler represents a fundamental struggle in human identity. Albeit, I'm not sure what. Hmm. That is, that is a pretty good way of looking at it. I, I think, you know, obviously you can boil it down to a really, like, baseline, like, ooh, you know, logical thinking versus, like, fantastical thinking kind of thing or whatever. But, uh, but I do think there is some uh, truth to that. Gota added the good stuff to the feast he made. What is the good stuff? <laughs> Kinzo is the real culprit with the servants. Okay. Interesting theory. Obviously there are a lot of people who could be the culprit at this point. Um, the d deep blue gray sea. Yeah, yeah. What are my thoughts and feelings on Goda? I love Goda. He's, he sucks and I love him. Uh, magic is real unless Battler is around, in which case he can retroactively make it not real with a shonen protagonist mind waves. <laughs> uh, the corpse of Kinzo in episode one is a fake one so that Kinzo can kill others. Okay, that's that's an interesting theory. But, uh, yeah, where, the, where, where could they get a fake corpse, though, uh, that would have the same amount of toes as him? Remember, uh, uh, Kinzo has polydactyl. He has six toes. So could he just casually find another cadaver to replace with himself that has six toes? In the kitchen. Oh no, yeah. Uh, definitely don't look up uh, resolutions to episode one just to know stuff, because if you look up the solutions to literally any of the individual episodes, you'll be spoiled for the end game. I'm warning you that right now. <laughs> Everyone actually has six toes. <laughs> Beatrice has three Marias in a trench coat. Well, I mean, I guess with magic, anything is possible. The thing I love about Goda is that he's just some guy. <laughs> yeah. uh, da, 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 da. Seeing the scene technically confirms the Battler and Beatrice are in the Battle of Wits for all eternity. I don't have any other theories. Six toe out of paper mache and Najo is just that bad of a doctor. <laughs> Uh, in fairness, he burned it. All he'd have to do is find someone else with polydactyl and char them beyond recognition. True, I, I suppose that's true, but uh, it would require finding somebody with that characteristic, I suppose. Uh, Nanjo is also some good guy. Uh, okay, so can the culprit culprit's perspective lie? When I Okay, let me put it this way. I don't want to. I don't want to spoil anything, so I'm going to keep my statements really vague here. But I am going to say that perspective is very important, and the perspective of whatever narrator is talking at any given time and who is present in what scene is important to the way that information is presented. I can't tell you how, but I'll go ahead and tell you that to satisfy a little bit of that itch, hopefully. For now, I'll say magic is fun and Bart Battler is a party pooper. True. Also, hi, Lore. Not a lot of the narrators are probably unreliable, if not every single one to a degree. Perhaps. Maybe. Who knows? Um, 
Couldn't Kinzo fake the body if we're going that route? Uh, IDK if I missed something, but the inspection of the bodies didn't seem too substantial to me. Um, yeah, I mean, the doctors are, uh, I mean, the doctors, the, the bodies are being examined by Nanjo, but he does say he's just like a general practitioner. Uh, he doesn't want to speak like too firmly on anything. He can just make observations from a doctor's perspective of like, oh, this may be how long they've been dead. They are dead, that kind of thing. But, uh, but yeah, he can't really get like super specific details because he can't perform an autopsy on the spot. And everybody else is just like a normie. They're not a doctor, so. And Nanjo is also a friend of Kinzo, so is not of trust. I, I I'm I'm loving I'm loving the speculation here. <laughs> Nanjo has the advantage of probably being able to lie. Perhaps. Perhaps. Um, by the way. Before we go, also, I think it would be a interesting thing to, to help you guys sort of adjust your perspectives a little bit as well. Um, so in the manga version of Umineko, at the end of every arc, uh, Ryukishi has like a little afterword that he writes, where basically he just like, you know, gives some thoughts and feelings about the episode and like some stuff about like what he's thinking with its uh, writing and execution and stuff like that. And I put this in my Discord server whenever we reach the end of episode one, but since some people probably aren't in there, let me just go ahead and read it to the chat. So, <clears throat> so this is a uh, this is a letter from Ryukishi concerning the end of episode one. So hopefully this will help you uh, with figuring out how to approach the information that you're being given now. <clears throat> Hello, I am Ryukishi07. Welcome to the world of Umineko when they cry. This is a classic closed-circle closed mystery combining a string of murders at a mansion on an isolated island with an eerie legend of a witch that surrounds the incident. After hearing that description, most people will say to themselves, Oh, I can tell without reading it that there will be witchy, spooky things going on that turn out to be a series of tricks perpetrated by a regular old human. And who can blame them? Everything that's been put out with a similar description is just like that, so it's no surprise that anyone would assume those were just the rules for this kind of thing. Was it the work of a witch or of a human? Of course, these outcomes are not compatible. If it's the work of humans, the story is a mystery. And if it's the work of witches, it can't be a mystery. In other words, at the point you define the story as a mystery, it's possible for the reader to say, there is no such thing as a witch. This is all the work of a human. That would mean that I've already lost the reader's participation in the line of thinking I most wanted to evoke, that of the balancing act between occult fantasy and logical mystery. In other words, I began writing Umineko when they cry so that the reader would not be lost in the identity, the trick, or the alibi of the killer, but in the step that comes before, whether or not the crime was even possible for a human to accomplish. Nearly all readers having just finished episode one should feel certain that these murders were acts of man dressed to look up, dressed up to look like the work of a witch. True, there are plenty of spots that are hard to explain, but you should be able to convince yourself that there's some fancy trick behind them, and I want to shake that certainty to its core in episode two. When we meet again in the afterword of episode two, I will be very interested to see how many of you still insist that this could be the work of human beings. After all, don't you find it very arrogant to assume that all things that happen in the world can be explained by humans? Are you starting to lose that confidence already? Since you're all so certain that the killer must be human, why not uphold that logic as far as you can take it? The Golden Witch will take many wicked steps to break you down. Will you still be detectives when we reunite? Or will you have sunk to being the witch's furniture? Until we meet again. And yes, uh, Kamikaze, that is the author notes from the manga. <clears throat> so, there you go. Uh, I believe that that should give you an idea of... Uh, some ways in which this material is meant to be approached. But I will refrain from saying any more because I would like to keep things vague. But uh, anyway, I think that's a, probably a good place to stop now. You secret keeping witch. Hee <laughs> hee. Ah, I keep so many more secrets than you could ever possibly know. Ah ha ha. Kee hee hee. Ha ha ha. 
Um, <laughs> um, anywho. I'll see you all later. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this Umineko stream. Next time we get into Umineko, things are going to really start popping off for episode two. And uh, I hope you'll all join me. Can I talk about my Umineko OC now? I'm sorry, no, I can't. I can't talk about that OC until we probably finish the series, actually. <laughs> anyway, so uh, so sorry. Uh, but see you guys later. Uh, you'll, you'll see me around soon. Bye-bye.